Introduction of Anthology of Magazine Verse for 1914 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Larry Wilson. Anthology of Magazine Verse for 1914 Edited by William Stanley Braithwaite Introduction the modern idea seems to be that poetry has no relation to life. Life, in the modern sense, is action, progress, success. Poetry has been conceded special themes. It can deal with passion, the strange and unnatural and unreal physical attraction of the sexes, with nature, with the symbols of mythology, and with the characteristic sentimental heroism of history and events. With reality, it must have nothing to do. It is supposed by the modern world of Anglo-Saxon literalness to create an atmosphere of illusion, which one must avoid to keep one's emotions from going astray in a civilization that needs the hardest kind of common sense. It is paradoxical that the English-speaking people, who have given the world the greatest poets, should take this false attitude while in possession of the greatest spiritual and imaginative legacy of life and experience bequeathed them from one generation to another during the last four hundred years escaping the illusion this modern world has become the prisoner of delusion for if poetry deals with anything it deals with reality no matter how remote the setting how subtle the communication the one hard fact about true poetry is its reality. The poet, at the core and center of life, surrounded with his dreams, his clairvoyant madness imbibed from the full draft of experience, his intensity of emotion, his childlike tenderness of sympathy, his quickening ecstasy of unashamed and unrestrained feeling, is considered the abnormal product of modern civilization. Well, in truth, he is alone the one normal type of modern mankind, because he alone is in absolute harmony and understanding with the real and common impulse of human destiny. The great secret of life is to discover by a process of related effects this common reality of experience. Most of mankind grope blindly in the dark and miss it, and by a kind of frenzied and pitiable ignorance acquire the abnormal character of conduct. The poet discovers, or at least puts his being wholly at the disposal of, these secrets, wins a serene and contemplative relationship to these effects, and lives a normal spiritual life. Harmony and rhythm are but two common terms that express and designate infinity. There was a man who was so absolutely sane that the scoffers of his day called him mad. This man was William Blake. Christ was a madman to the community of his day. Even his closest friends and disciples were not without doubt at times as to his sanity. But these two men were never a hair's breadth from the commonest reality of existence. They realized imaginative facts, and kept in absolute tune with the harmony and rhythm of life, not merely with what they saw with the actual eye, but with that more penetrative, more limitless sense, the seeing soul. They were poets, and the one insistent quality of their message was the reality of mortal and immortal life. It is hard to make a certain type of mind understand that all which is seen with the physical eye and touched with the fleshly hand is illusion. That kind of a mind does not understand symbols. It belongs to the so-called practical people of the world, who obey but do not comprehend laws, whose laws indeed are the conventions of minds similar to their own. They organize, but do not construct. They interpret, but do not create. They are the wheels, and not the motor power, of the engine of civilization and humanity. These are the people who make up nine-tenths of the world's population. Without the other tenth, they would perish. Their reality in life is mathematical immediacy, the cloak of visibility in which they are wrapped to go about their daily tasks in the world. Now poetry sees in these people and their affairs only the symbols of what is real, looks upon their whole fantastic display of living as the illusion beneath which their real living is concealed. 
the crises of their joys and sorrows their aspirations and passions hidden in the reality of their consciousness where exists an infinite universe of being and where every event of their lives is enacted before their shadow is thrown upon the stage of the world the fact of life is there hidden away in the solitary soul determining the illusions of conductual existence it is crowded with moods emotions and feelings experienced with such intensity that what breaks forth in actual deed and event is but a faint reflection of the real experience the soul has gone through the ideal is the real because it is what one has lived but cannot express in the related experience of human intercourse poetry comes nearer finality in embodying the exact meaning and intensity of human feeling than any other art human feeling being the root of all individual intelligence is the most inexplicable quantity in life intuition is the primary significance of our existence and it is the quality which gives to poetry its visionary and spiritual substance in a nation it is the register of a people's culture the study of poetry in the magazines which i began ten years ago has grown into the convincing evidence of the following pages of this book during this time we have passed through a number of phases in our national life but through these changing aspects of national aspirations there has run like a widening and brightening strand of culture the development of a new period of poetry both in its productive and appreciative aspects from nineteen hundred to nineteen five poetry had declined and i think there has never been another period in our history when so unintelligent and indifferent an attitude existed toward the art the scale since nineteen five has been ascending and the high pitch of achievement has not yet been reached whether fine poetry creates a general and popular recognition of the art or the sympathetic appreciation of poetry for itself encourages excellent production i cannot say but this is apparent that a period or epoch of the highest achievement has always been one of popular appreciation a factor that should be taken into consideration and which affects poetry and its audience is the attitude of the book reviews in our most influential literary journals a characteristic example is the new york nation which has been in the habit of grouping in a few articles during the year with indiscriminate selection the volumes of poetry which it receives in these reviews there is a supercilious and academic attitude which dismisses really important work with opinions which have every suggestion of preconceived judgment one has only to turn back his files to the review of macefield's everlasting mercy and the widow in the by street to see the type of poetry reviewing that is more common than uncommon in american periodicals and newspapers i do not mean to make the nation an exception but an illustration of the kind of stewardship with which reviewers in some of our most authoritative publications perform the duties of a serious and distinguished branch of american authorship to show that there is a quality of poetry in our national production worthy of pride and support it has been my privilege for a number of years to emphasize in an annual review the distinction of the verse in the magazines out of these reviews has grown a demand for a more permanent preservation of the best work resulting in this annual anthology of magazine verse to which are added records references and criticisms which constitute a yearbook of american poetry while all the other arts have had this service performed in their interests poetry the one art that most needed such a special reinforcement of its achievement has been permitted to drift along throughout our entire critical history without this sort of attention the poetry in the magazines this year has been of an excellence in the longer pieces beyond the standard of any year in which i have made these estimates the selections in this volume give evidence of a serious even anxious probing of human life the lyric represented by some lovely work has not been practiced with the same irresponsible emotional delight as in past years perhaps there has never been a year when the american poets have shown the independence of their own efforts when comparatively new work has been so free from english influences what influences there are seem to come from french sources verzelib has been taken out of the hands of weak and pompous innovators 
and made a distinctive medium by a few earnest and powerful singers the most notable distinction in this respect is to be found in the work of james oppenheim whose book songs for the new age is a milestone in our poetic progress so is vachel lindsay's new work he has mastered a new form of poetic expression in his volume the congo and other poems miss amy lowell in the better parts of sword blades and poppy seed is working toward a new elasticity and rhythm which is beginning to produce effective and beautiful results on the other hand mr arthur stringer in open water utterly fails to embody in actual performance the principles expounded in the introduction to that volume though this introduction is as important a piece of critical writing in english upon the subject as i know no matter how revolutionary they attempt to be in expression there is still in these writers a traditional note imbuing the substance which makes up the significant part of their creativeness the selections in this volume are chosen from all kinds and methods of poetic expression and the reader's attention is invited to their differences in many aspects though the aspect of quality is i think of equal attainment in all of such poems as bliss carman's phi beta kappa poem percy mckay's fight vachel lindsay's the fireman's ball eloise britton's the two flames conrad aiken's romance olive tilford dargan's old fairing down and path flower joyce kilmer's twenty forty five and don marquis's the godmaker man of the shorter pieces i think the standard is decidedly above last year's quality malone leonard fisher has again followed the success of previous years with his sonnet afterwards which sustains his position as one of the foremost sonnet writers this country has yet produced this poet has the unusual distinction of a fine reputation without having published a book but his definite contribution to american poetry will soon take place with the publication of his first volume an old mercer and other poems a poem likely to create a profound impression is don marquis the godmaker man a fine achievement not only for its flashing images but for spiritual substance shaped with compelling conviction the selections in this volume reflect the extraordinary richness of the published volumes this year i do not recall any year of the past decade when the quantity and quality alike have been so notable the autumn season's publication of verse usually shows a preponderance in quality of books by english poets who seem to meet with more favorable consideration from the best established publishers there have been this year a number of notable volumes by english poets brought out in this country but the balance of distinction both in standard and numbers of books belongs this year most emphatically to the american poets thirty-five volumes of distinguished poetry stand to our credit and these are only a selection from a larger number of books which merit appreciation books by louis v ledoux george edward woodbury louis untermeyer walter conrad ehrensburg william rose benet vachel lindsay george sterling olive tilford dargan corinne roosevelt robinson conrad aiken james oppenheim harry kemp amelia josephine burr joyce kilmer amy lowell percy mckay arthur davison fick edwin markham agnes lee and bliss carman are among those which have advanced the significance of the year's output the european war has had a more immediate effect upon literature than almost anything else all books of a non-military character published just before the war with the exception of poetry have been thrown into relatively ineffective significance poetry endures because it is integrally woven into the warp of man's real existence and not that of illusory substance of which other kinds of imaginative literature are fashioned and which has been so easily wiped away by this war's primal brutality and poetry has aspired to sustain the nobler part of man's nature during the confusion into which civilization has been plunged since the war began the english people who have been in the world's vanguard practicing democratic ideals have in their poets to-day shattered the idol of war and are glorifying the ideals of peace the best poems in english directly inspired by the war have been produced by american poets 
of these i have gathered a representative group in this volume the work achieved by percy mackay on different phases of the european war has made more secure than ever his position as a poet it is no exaggeration to say that the two groups of sonnets which originally appeared in the boston transcript in august and september and which are now included in this volume the present hour are comparable as a whole to william watson's the purple east and in such individual pieces as kruppism and the real germany he has done work finer and more impressive than is to be found in any of the older writer's sonnets moreover such pieces as if and the other army by bartholomew f griffin prelude by edmund mckenna he went for a soldier by ruth comfort mitchell and to a necrophile by walter conrad ehrensberg are striking and spontaneous poetry of a high order in e sutton a poet is presented who has produced martial poetry in the bugle the drum and the stirring pipes of the north which for swinging rhythm and profound reflection upon the pomp and futility of military glory has not been equalled by any contemporary poet a notable feature of the poetry year is the kinnerly edition of walt whitman's leaves of grass the works of whitman have been transferred from publisher to publisher so often that there has been little opportunity for their circulation among the people for whom he wrote this edition contains the text and arrangement preferred by the poet himself and is the only perfect and complete issue comprising one hundred and six additional poems not included in any other edition there are suitable editions to meet the demand of all classes of whitman enthusiasts and students an india paper edition bound in leather a library edition bound in cloth and two issues of a popular edition bound in cloth and in paper respectively to these are added the complete prose in a library and popular edition in cloth none of the leading american poets of the past generation have been so unfortunate in publication and many who believe whitman to be america's greatest poet will be glad to know that now by the authorization of his executors all his works are gathered in uniform editions under one imprint other important new editions of poetry are the cheap reissue by the oxford university press of john sampson's final and authoritative text of william blake's complete poems and the new reprint and bond's popular library issued by the macmillan company of henry vaughan's complete poems as in former years in my annual summary in the boston transcript i have examined the contents of the leading american magazines to the seven magazines which i examined last year namely harper's scribner's the century the form lippincott's the smart set and the bellman i have added this year three monthlies the trend the international and the masses and one quarterly the yale review the bellman still maintains its high poetic distinction by virtue of which it prints more good poetry than any other american weekly and most american monthlies as last year i have winnowed from other magazines distinctive poems for classification and notice one each from the metropolitan the craftsman the poetry journal the southern woman's magazine puck and the infantry journal and two each from poetry a magazine of verse the nation the atlantic monthly and the outlook while from three newspapers i have selected fourteen poems eleven from the boston evening transcript two from the boston news bureau and one from the new york evening sun in quoting from the boston transcript i wish to testify to the ready recognition and encouragement this daily paper has offered to poets and poetry it is one of the paper's finest traditions the poems published during the year in the eleven representative magazines i have submitted to an impartial critical test choosing from the total number what i consider the distinctive poems of the year from the distinctive pieces are selected fifty-two poems to which are added thirty from other magazines and from newspapers not represented in the list of eleven making a total of eighty-two which are intended to represent what i call an anthology of magazine verse for nineteen fourteen quoting from what i have written in previous years to emphasize the methods which guided my selections the reader will see how impartial are the tests by which the distinctive and best poems are chosen quote, i have not allowed any special sympathy with the subject to influence my choice i have taken the poet's point of view 
and accepted his value of the theme he dealt with the question was how vital and compelling did he make it the first test was the sense of pleasure the poem communicated then to discover the secret or the meaning of the pleasure felt and in doing so to realize how much richer one became in a knowledge of the purpose of life by reason of the poem's message unquote. in one hundred and forty seven numbers of these eleven magazines i find there were published during nineteen fourteen a total of six hundred forty seven poems of which one hundred fifty seven were poems of distinction the total number of poems printed in each magazine and the number of the distinctive poems are century total seventy one nineteen of distinction harper's total thirty nine ten of distinction scribner's total forty nine eighteen of distinction forum total thirty three thirteen of distinction lippincott's total fifty six eight of distinction the smart set excluding november and december total one hundred fourteen eighteen of distinction the bellman until november seventh total forty two twenty three of distinction the yale review total nineteen ten of distinction the trend april and june to november total fifty one sixteen of distinction the masses excluding december total fifty three thirteen of distinction the international excluding november and december total eighty six nine of distinction following the text of the poems making the anthology in this volume i have given the titles and authors of all the poems classified as distinctive published in the magazines of the year in addition i give a list of all the poems and their authors in the one hundred and forty seven numbers of the magazines examined as a record which readers and students of poetry will find useful i wish to acknowledge my indebtedness and thanks to the editors of scribner's magazine harper's magazine the forum the century magazine the outlook lippincott's magazine the bellman the smart set the yale review poetry and magazine of verse the poetry journal the international the masses the metropolitan harper's weekly the craftsman the nation the southern woman's magazine puck the infantry journal the boston news bureau the new york evening sun and the boston evening transcript and to the publisher of these magazines and newspapers for kind permission to reprint in this volume the poems making up the anthology of magazine verse for nineteen fourteen to the authors of these poems i am equally indebted and grateful for their willingness to have me reprint their work in this form since their appearance in the magazines and before the close of the year when the contents of this volume was made up twenty-eight poems herein included have appeared in volumes of original poetry by their authors for the use of yankee doodle and the fireman's ball by vachel lindsay included in his volume the congo and other poems a fight france and six sonnets august nineteen fourteen by percy mckay included in his volume the present hour and for romance by conrad aiken included in his volume earth triumphant i have also to thank the macmillan company under whose imprint these volumes appear similar acknowledgment is due to the george h duran company for permission to reprint the twelve forty five by joyce kilmer included in his volume trees and other poems and to print in the roman forum and the linmouth widow by amelia josephine burr included in her volume in deep places i am grateful to charles scribner's sons for two poems by olive tilford dargon old fairing down and pathflower included in her volume pathflower and for two poems by corinne roosevelt robinson from a motor in may and if you should cease to love me included in her volume one woman to another i am indebted to mr mitchell kinnerly for kind permission to reprint sonnets twenty nine thirty and thirty seven from sonnets of a portrait painter and to mr a m robertson for two poems by george sterling ballad of two seas and the hunting of diane included in his volume beyond the breakers and other poems finally the century company have been kind enough to permit me to publish landscapes and summons by louis untermeyer from his volume entitled challenge and patterns a handful of dust and we dead by james oppenheim from his volume entitled songs for a new age if i have omitted any acknowledgments it is quite unintentional and i trust that any such omission 
will be regarded leniently i wish it to be understood that the privilege extended to me so courteously by the authors magazine editors and publishers and book publishers to print the poems in this volume does not in any sense restrict the authors in their rights to print the poems in volumes of their own or in any other place i wish to thank the boston transcript for the privilege of reprinting material in this book which originally appeared in the columns of that paper a new feature this year is the series of critical summaries of new volumes of verse which are significant and which have been appraised in accordance with the same principles as the poems in the anthology of magazine verse it is believed that by adding this feature the book will more nearly approximate to being an actual yearbook of american poetry and it is in this belief that a subtitle has been added to this volume i believe that not only libraries but private individuals will welcome the selected lists of the best volumes for library purchase graded according to the requirements of a large or a small purse a list is also subjoined of the best books about poetry and if there seems to be demand for this innovation it is planned next year to include in the book critical summaries of these volumes as well as of the volumes of original verse i shall be grateful for suggestions as to improvements of this year book in future years and as to valuable extensions of its scope to all friends who have assisted this volume by their personal efforts and to the readers of past years who have made this annual publication possible by promoting it through their interest in poetry i tender my grateful thanks there are too many to name here but my gratitude for their efforts is none the less sincere w s b cambridge massachusetts november nineteen fourteen end of introduction Landscapes by Lois Untermeyer Read for LibriVox.org by Lily Alphonse For Clement R. Wood The rain was over, and the brilliant air Made every little blade of grass appear. Vivid and startling, everything was there, With sharpened outlines, eloquently clear, As though one saw it in a crystal sphere. The rusty sumac with its struggling spires, the goldenrod with all its million fires, a million torches swinging in the wind. A single poplar, marvelously thinned, half like a naked boy, half like a sword, clouds like the haughty banners of the Lord. A group of pansies with their shrewish faces, little old ladies cackling over laces, the quaint unhurried road that curved so well, the prim petunias with their rich rank smell the lettuce birds, the creepers in the field, how bountifully were they all revealed, how arrogantly each one seemed to thrive, so frank and strong, so radiantly alive. And over all the morning-minded earth there seemed to spread a sharp and kindling mirth, piercing the stubborn stones until I saw the toad-faced heaven without shame or awe, the ant confront the stars, and every weed grow proud as though it bore a royal seed, while all the things that die and decompose send forth their bloom as richly as the rose. Oh, what a liberal power that made them thrive and keep the very dirt that died alive. And now I saw the slender willow tree, no longer calm and drooping listlessly, letting its languid branches sway and fall as though it danced in some sad ritual but rather like a young athletic girl, fearless and gay, her hair all out of curl, and flying in the wind, her head thrown back, her arms flung up, her garments flowing slack, and all her rushing spirits running over, what made a sober tree seem such a rover, or made the staid and stalwart apple trees, that stood for a year's knee-deep in velvet peace, turn all their fruit to little worlds of flame, and burn the trembling orchard there below, what lit the heart of every golden glow? Oh, why was nothing weary, dull, or tame? Beauty it was, and keen, compassionate mirth that drives the vast and energetic earth. And, with abrupt and visionary eyes, I saw the huddled tenements arise, here where the merry clover danced and shone, sprang agonies of iron and of stone, 
There, where the green silence laughed or stood enthralled, cheap music blared and evil alleys sprawled, the roaring avenues, the shrieking mills, brothels and prisons on those kindly hills, the menace of these things swept over me, a threatening, unconquerable sea. A stirring landscape and a generous earth, freshening courage and benevolent mirth, and then the city, like a hideous sore. Good God, and what is all this beauty for? Century, Louis Untermeyer. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Phi Beta Kappa Poem by Bliss Carmen. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Harvard, 1914. Sir, friends, and scholars, we are here to serve a high occasion. Our New England wears all her unrivaled beauty as of old, and June with scent of bayberry and rose and song of orioles, as she only comes by Massachusetts Bay, is here once more, companioning our fete of fellowship. The open trails south, west, and north lead back from populous cities or from lonely plains. Ranch, pulpit, office, factory, desk, or mill. To this fair tribunal of ambitious youth, the shadowy town beside the placid Charles, where Harvard waits us through the passing years, conserving and administering still her savor for the gladdening of the race. Yearly of all the sons she has sent forth, and men her admiration would adopt, she summons whom she will back to her side, as if to ask, how fares my cause of truth in the great world beyond these studious walls? Here from their store of life experience they must make answer as grace is given them, and their plain creed and verity declare. Among the many there is sometimes called one who, like Arnold's scholar Gypsy Poor, is but a seeker on the dusky way, still waiting for the spark from heaven to fall. He must bethink him first of other days, and that old scholar of the seraphic smile, as we recall him in this very place with all the sweetest culture of his age, his gentle courtesy and friendliness, a chivalry of soul now strangely rare, and that ironic wit which made him to the unflinching critic and most dreaded foe of all things mean, unlovely, and untrue. What Mr. Norton said with that slow smile has put the fear of God in many a heart, even while his hand encouraged eager youth. From such enheartening, who would not dare to speak? See, no truth can be too small to serve, and no word worthless that is born of love. Within the noisy workshop of the world, where still the strife is upward out of gloom, men doubt the value of high teaching, cry, what use is learning? Man must have his will. The elan of life alone is paramount. Away with old traditions. We are free. So folly mocks at truth and freedom's name. Pale anarchy leads on with furious shriek. Her envious horde of reckless malcontents and mad destroyers of the commonwealth, while privilege with indifference grows corrupt, till the republic stands in jeopardy from following false idols and ideals. Those sane men cry for honesty once more, order and duty, and self-sacrifice. Our world and all it holds of good for us, our fathers and unselfish mothers made, with noble passion and enduring toil, strenuous, frugal, reverent, and elate, caring above all else to guard and save the ampler life of the intelligence and the fine honor of a scrupulous code, ideals of manhood touched with the divine. For this they founded these great schools we serve, Harvard, Columbia, Princeton, Dartmouth, Yale, Amherst and Williams, trusting to our hands the heritage of all they held most high, possessions of the spirit and the mind, investments in the provinces of joy vast provinces are these and fortunate they who at their will may go adventuring there exploring all the boundaries of truth learning the roads that run through beauty's realm 
citing the pinnacles where good meets god encompassed by the eternal unknown sea even for a little to o'erlook those lands the kingdoms of religion science art is to be made forever happier with blameless memories that shall bring content and inspiration for all after days and fortunate they whom destiny allows to rest within those provinces and serve the dominion of ideals all their lives for whoso will putting dull greed aside and holding fond allegiance to the best may dwell there and find fortitude and joy in the free fellowship of kindred minds one band of scholar gypsies i have known whose purpose all unworldly was to find an answer to the riddle of the earth a key that should unlock the book of life and secrets of its sorceries reveal this they discovered had long since been found and laid aside forgotten and unused our dark young poet who from dartmouth came was told the secret by his gypsy bride who had it from a master overseas and he it was first hinted to the band the magic of that universal lore before the great mysteriarch summoned him it was the doctrine of the threefold life the beginning of the end of all their doubt in that victorian age it has become so much the fashion now to half despise within the shadow of cathedral walls they had been schooled and heard the mellow chimes for lenten litanies and daily prayers with a mild eloquent beloved voice exhorting to all virtue and that peace surpassing understanding casting there that last enchantment of the middle age the spell of oxford and her ritual so duteous youth was trained until there grew restive outreaching in men's thought to find some certitude beyond the dusk of faith they cried on mysticism to be gone mazed in the shadowy princedom of the soul then as old creeds fell round them into dust they reached through science to belief and law made reason paramount in man and guessed at reigning mind within the universe piercing the fragments of a fair design with reverent patience and courageous skill they saw the world from chaos step by step under far-seeing guidance and restraint emerged to order and to symmetry as logical and sure as music's own with spencer darwin tyndall and the rest our band saw roads of knowledge open wide through the uncharted province of the truth as on they fared through that unfolding world yet there they found no rest house for the heart no well sufficient for the spirit's thirst no shade nor glory for the senses starved turning they fled by moonlit trails to seek the magic principality of art where loveliness not learning rules supreme they stood intoxicated with delight before the poised unanxious splendor of the greek they mused upon the gothic minstered gray where mystic spirit took on mighty form until their prayers to lovely churches turned like a remembrance of the middle age they rose where ralph and bertram dreamed in stone entranced they trod a painter's paradise where color wasted by the situate shore between the changing marshes and the sea they heard the golden voice of poesy lulling the senses with its last caress in tennysonian accents pure and fine and all their laurels were for beauty's brow though toiling reason went ungarlanded then poisonous weeds of artifice sprang up defiling nature at her sacred source and there the questing world soul could not stay onward must journey with the changing time to come to this uncouth rebellious age where not an ancient creed nor courtesy is underrided and each demagogue cries some new nostrum for the cure of ills to-day the unreasoning iconoclast would scoff at science and abolish art to let untutored impulse rule the world let learning perish and the race return to that first anarchy from which we came when spirit moved upon the deep and laid the primal chaos under cosmic law and even now in all our wilful might the satiated being cannot abide 
but to that austere country turns again the little province of the saints of god where lofty peaks rise upward to the stars from the gray twilight of gethsemane and spirit dares to climb with wounded feet where justice peace and loving-kindness are what says the lore of human power we hold through all these striving and tumultuous days why not accept each several bloom of good without discarding good already gained as one might weed a garden overgrown save the new shoots yet not destroy the old only the fool would root up his whole patch of fragrant flowers to plant the newer seed ah softly brothers have we not the key whose first fine luminous use platinus gave teaching that ecstasy must lead the man three things we see men in this life require as they are needed in the universe first of all spirit energy or love the soul and mainspring of created things next wisdom knowledge culture discipline to guide impetuous spirit to its goal and lastly strength the sound apt instrument adjusted and controlled to lawful needs the next world teacher must be one whose word shall reaffirm the primacy of soul hold scholarship in her high guiding place and recognize the body's equal right to culture such as it has never known in power and beauty serving soul and mind inheritors of this divine ideal with courage to be fine as well as strong shall know what common manhood may become regain the gladness of his sons of morn the radiance of immortality out of heroic wanderings of the past and all the wayward gropings of our time unswerved by doubt unconquered by despair the messenger of such hope must go as one who hears far off before the dawn on some lone trail among the darkling hills the hermit thrushes in the paling dusk and at the omen lifts his eyes to see above him with its silent shafts of light the sunrise kindling all the peaks with fire the form bliss carmen end of poem this recording is in the public domain the deserted pasture by bliss carmen Read for LibriVox.org by Lily Alphonse. I love the stony pasture that no one else will have, The old gray rocks so friendly seem, so durable and brave. In tranquil contemplation it watches through the year, Seeing the frosty stars arise, the slender moons appear. Its music is the rain wind, its choristers the birds, And there are secrets in its heart too wonderful for words. It keeps the bright-eyed creatures that play about its walls, though long ago its milking herds were banished from their stalls. Only the children come there for buttercups in May, or nuts in autumn where it lies dreaming the hours away. Long since its strength was given to making good increase, and now its soul is turned again to beauty and to peace. There in the early springtime the violets are blue, and at her tongues in coats of gold are garmented anew. There bayberry and aster are crowded on its floors when marching summer halts to praise the lord of out of doors. And then October passes in gorgeous livery, in purple ash and crimson oak and golden tulip tree. And when the winds of winter their bugles blast again, I watch the battalions come to pitch their tents therein. Atlantic Monthly, Bliss Carmen, End of Poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Phoebe Bird by Witter Binner. Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee. Under the eaves, out of the wet, you nest within my reach. You never sing for me, and yet you have a golden speech. You sit and quirk a rapid tail, wrinkle a ragged crest, 
then pirouette from tree to rail and vault from rail to nest and when in frequent witty fright you gaily slip and fade and when at hand you be alight demure and unafraid and when you bring your brooded's fill of iridescent wings and green legs dewy in your bill your silence is what sings not of a feather that enjoys to prate or praise or preach o oh, phoebe with your lack of noise what eloquence you teach and a poem this recording is in the public domain from a motor in may by corin roosevelt robinson Read for LibriVox.org by Lily Alphonse. The leaves of autumn and the buds of spring meet and commingle on our winding way, and we who glide into the heart of May sense in our souls a sudden quivering. What though the flesh of blue or scarlet wing bid us forget the night and dawning day, skies of November, sullen, sad, and gray, once hung above this withered covering. There is no spring that autumn has not known, nor any autumn spring has not divined. The odor of dead flowers in the wind shall but enrich a fairer blossoming, and though they shiver from a breeze outblown, the leaves of autumn guard the buds of spring. The Outlook Corin Roosevelt Robinson End of Poem This recording is in the public domain. To a Garden in April by Walter Conrad Arzenberg Read for LibriVox.org by Lily Alphonse Alas, and are you pleading now for pardon? Spring came by night, and so there was no telling. Spring had his way with you, my little garden. You hide in leaf, but oh, your buds are swelling. The Trend Walter Conrad Arzenberg End of Poem this recording is in the public domain. Jewelweed by Florence Earl Coates Read for LibriVox.org by Lily Alphonse Thou lonely dew-wet mountain road, Traversed by toiling feet each day, What rare enchantment maketh thee appear so gay? Thy sentinels on either hand rise tamarack, birch, and balsam fir, or the familiar shrubs that greet the wayfarer. But here is a magic cometh new, a joy to gladden thee indeed, this passionate outflowering of the jewel weed, that now when days are growing drear as summer dreams that she is old, hangs out a myriad pleasure bells of mottled gold. Thine only, these, thou lonely road, Though hands that take and not restore Rob thee of other treasured things, Thine these are, for A fairy cradled in each bloom To all who pass the charmed spot Whispers in warning, Friend, admire, but touch me not. Leave me to blossom where I sprung, A joy untarnished shall I seem, Pluck me and you dispel the charm And blur the dream. The Bellman Florence Earl Coates End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Irish by Edward J. O'Brien My father and mother were Irish, and I am Irish too. I pipe you a bag of whistles, and it is Irish too. T'will sing with you in the morning, and play with you at noon, and dance with you in the evening to a little Irish tune my mother and father were irish and i am irish too and here is a bag of whistles for it is irish too boston transcript edward j o'brien end of poem this recording is in the public domain the regent's examination by jesse wallace hewan read for LibriVox.org by daniel silverman Muffled sounds of the city climbing to me at the window. Here in the summer noontime, students busily writing. 
children of quaint-clad immigrants fresh from the hut and the ghetto, writing of pious Aeneas and funeral rites of Anchises, old-world credo and custom, alien accents and features, plunged in the free-school hopper, grist for the Anglo-Saxons, old-world sweetness and light and fiery struggle of heroes, flashed on the blinking peasants, dull with the grime of their bondage. Race that are infant in knowledge, ancient in grief and traditions, lore that is tranquil with age and starry with gleams of the future. What is the thing that will come from the might of the elements blending? Neuter and safe shall it be? Or a flame to burst us asunder? Scribner's Magazine Jesse Wallace Hewan End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Yankee Doodle by Vachel Lindsay. Read for LibriVox by Lisa Green. Dawn this morning burned all red, watching them in wonder. There I saw our spangled flag divide the clouds asunder. Then there followed Washington. Ah, he rode from glory cold and mighty as his name, and stern as freedom's story. Unsubdued by burning dawn, led his continentals, vast they were and strange to see, in gray old regimentals. Marching still with bleeding feet, bleeding feet and jesting, marching from the judgment throne with energy unresting. How their merry quickstep played, silver, sharp, sonorous, piercing through with prophecy the demon's rumbling chorus. Behold the ancient powers of sin and slavery before them, sworn to stop the glorious dawn, the pit-black clouds hung o'er them. Plagues that rose to bless the day, fiend and tiger faces, monsters plotting bloodshed for the patient toiling races. Round the dawn their cannon raged, hurling bolts of thunder, Yet before our spangled flag, their host was cut asunder. Like a mist they fled away, and in wrath and roaring. Still our restless soldier host from east to west went pouring. High beside the sun of noon, they bore our banner splendid. All its days of stain and shame and heaviness were ended. Men were swelling now the throng from great and lowly station. Valiant citizens today of every tribe and nation. Not till their night their rear guard came, down the west went marching, and left behind the sunset rays in beauty overarching. War god banners lead us still, rob, enslave, and harry. Let us rather choose today the flag the angels carry. Flag we love, but brighter far, soul of it made splendid. Let its days of stain and shame and heaviness be ended. Let its fifes fill all the sky, redeemed souls marching after. Hills and mountains shake with song while seas roll on in laughter. The Metropolitan, Vachel Lindsay. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fight by Percy McKay, a collaborative reading for LibriVox.org. Jock, read by Greg Giordano. Ma, read by Deanna Lee. Pa, read by Larry Wilson. Jean, read by Lisa Green. McDonough, read by Dan McNellan. Sailor One, read by Derek Atwater. Sailor Two, read by Larry Wilson. Sailor Three, read by Elijah Fisher. Narrator, read by Red Run. Fight, the tale of a gunner at Plattsburgh, 1814. Jock bit his mittens off and blew his thumbs. He scraped the fresh sleet from the frozen sign. Men wanted, volunteers. Like gusts of brine, 
He whiffed deliriums of sound, the droning roar of rolling, rolling drums, and shrilling fifes like needles in his spine, and drank, blood bright from sunrise and wild shore, the wine of war. With ears and eyes he drank, and dizzy brain, till all the snow danced red. The little shacks that lined the road of muffled hackmatacks were roofed with a red stain, which spread in reeling rings on icy blue champlain, and splotched the sky like daubs of sealing wax that darkened when he winked, and when he stared, caught fire and flared. Men wanted, volunteers, the village street, topped by the slouching store and slim flagpole, loomed grand as Rome to his expanding soul. Grandly the rhythmic beat of feet in file and flags and fifes and filing feet, the roar of brass and unremitting roll of drums and drums bewitched his boyish mood till he hallooed. His strident echo stung the lake's wild dawn and startled him from dreams. Jock rammed his cap and rubbed a numb ear with the furry flap, then bolted like a fawn, bounding through shin-deep sleigh ruts in his shaggy brawn, blowing white frost wreaths from red mouth agap, till in a gabled porch beyond the store he burst the door. Mother, he panted. Hush, your pa ain't up. He's worser since the storm. What struck ye so? It's volunteers, the old dame stammered. Oh, and stopped and stirred her sup of morning tea and stared down in the trembling cup. They're mustering on the common now. I know, she nodded feebly. Then, with sharp surmise, she raised her eyes. She raised her eyes and poured their light on him who towered glowing there, bright lips apart, cap off and brown hair tousled. With quick smart, she felt the room turn dim, and seemed she heard far off a sound of cherubim, soothing the sudden pain about her heart. How many a lonely hour of after woe she saw him so. Jock? And once more the white lips murmured. Jock! Her fingers slipped, the spilling teacup fell and shattered, tinkling, but broke not the spell. His heart began to knock, jangling the hollow rhythm of the ticking clock. Mother! It's fight, and men are wanted. Well, ah well, it's men may kill us women's joys. It's men, not boys. I'm seventeen. I guess that's seventeen. My little jock. Little? I'm six foot one. Scorn twitched his lip. You saw me. How I stunned the town last Halloween at wrestling. Now the mother shifted tack. But Jean? You won't be leaving Jean. I guess a gun won't rattle her. <laughs> he laughed and turned his head. His face grew red. But if it does, a gal don't understand. It's fight. Jock boy, your pa can't last much more. And who's to mind the stock, to milk and chore? Jock frowned and gnawed his hand. Mother, it's men must mind the stock, our own born land, and lick the invaders. Slowly in the door stubbed the old worn-out man. Woman, let be. It's liberty. It struck him like fork lightning in a pine. I felt it, too, like that in seventy-six. And now... If twant for creepin' pains and cricks, and this one leg o' mine, I'd holler young Jerusalem like him and jine the fight. 
that fight don't come from burnt-out wicks. It comes from fire. Maybe, she said. It comes from fives and drums. Dad, all the boys are down from the back hills. The commons cackling like hell's cocks and hens. There's swords and muskets stacked in the cow pens and knapsacks in the mills. They say at Isle Oxenoy, redcoats are holding drills, and we're to build a big fleet at Vergine. Dad, can I go? I reckon you are a man. Of course you can. I'll do the chores to home. You do em thar. Dad. Lad. The men gripped hands and gazed upon the mother. When the door flew wide, there shone a young face like a star, a gleam of bitter sweet against snowy islands far, a freshness like the scent of cinnamon, tinging the air with ardor and bright sheen. Jock faltered. Jean! Jock, don't you hear the drums? I dreamed all night I heard them, and they woke me in black dark. Quick, ain't you coming? Can't you hear em? Hark, the men folks are to fight. I wish I was a man. Jock felt his throat clutch tight. Men folks? It lit his spirit like a spark, flashing the pent gunpowder of his pride. Come on, he cried. Here, wait. The old man stumped to the back wall and handed down his musket. You'll want this, and mind what game you're after, and don't miss. Goodbye. I guess that's all for now. Come back and get your duds. Jock, looming tall beside his glowing sweetheart, stooped to kiss the little shrunken mother. Tiptoe she rose and clutched him close. In both her twisted hands she held his head, Clutched in the wild remembrance of dim years, A baby head, suckling, half dewed with tears, A tired boy abed. By candlelight, a laughing face beside the red log fire, A shock of curls beneath her shears, The bright hair falling. Ah, she tried to smother her wild thoughts. Mother, mother he stuttered. Baby Jock, she moaned and looked far in his eyes, and he was gone. The porch door banged. Out in the blood-bright dawn, all that she once had owned, her heart's proud empire, passed. Her life's dream sank unthroned. With hands still reached, she stood there staring, wan. Hark, woman, said the bowed old man. What's the tolling? Drums, drums were rolling. Shy wings flashed in the orchard, glitter, glitter. Blue wings bloomed soft through blossom-colored leaves, and Phoebe, Phoebe, whistled from gray eaves through water shine and twitter and spurt of flamy green. All bane of earth and bitter took life and tasted sweet at the glad reprieves of spring, save only in an old dame's heart that grieved apart. Crook back and small, she pulled the big well sweep. Creak, went the pole. The bucket came up brimming. On the bright water lay a cricket swimming, whose brown legs tried to leap. But draggling, twitched and foundered in the circling deep. The old dame gasped. Her thin hand snatched him, skimming. Dear Lord, he's drowned. She mumbled with dry lips. The ships, the ships. Gently she laid him in the sun and dried the little dripping body. Suddenly, 
rose red gleamed through the budding apple tree, and Look, a letter! cried a laughing voice. And lots of news for us inside. How's that, Jean? News from Jock? Where? Where is he? Down in Virgin's, the shipyards. Ships? Ah, oh, no, it can't be so. He's going to fight with guns and be a tar. See here, he's rode himself. The post was late. He couldn't write before. The ship is great. She's built from keel to spar and called the Saratoga. And Jock's got a scar already. Scar? The mother quavered. Wait. Jean rippled. Let me read. Quick then, my dear. He'll want to hear. Jock's paw. I guess we'll find him in the yard. He ain't scarce creepin' round these days, poor Dan. She gripped Jean's arm and stumbled as they ran, and stopped once, breathing hard. Around them, chimney swallows skimmed the sheep-cropped sward, and yellow hornets hummed. The sick old man stirred at their steps, and muttered from deep mews, Well, Ma, what news? From Jockey. There's a letter. In his chair, the bowed form sat bolt upright. What's he say? He's wrote to Jean. I guess it's boys their way to think old folks don't care for letters. Girl, read out. Jean smoothed her wilding hair and sat beside them. Out of the blue day, a golden robin called. Across the road, a heifer lowed. And old ears listened while youth read, Friend Jean, Vergine, here's where we played a Yankee trick. I'm layin' in my bunk by Otter Creek, and scribblin' you this mean scrawl for to tell the news what all I've heard and seen. Jenny, we've built a ship and built her slick, a swan, a seven hundred forty tonner, and I'm first gunner. You ought to seen us launch her the other day. Tell Dad we christened her for a fight of his'n. He fought at Saratoga. Now just listen. She's twice as big, folks say, as Perry's ship that took the prize at Putin Bay. Yet forty days ago, home, masts, and mizzen, the whole of her was growing, live and limber, in God's green timber. I helped to fell her main mast back in March. The woods were snowed knee deep. She was a wonder, a straight white pine. She fell like roar and thunder and left a blue sky arch. Above her bustin all to kindlin's a tall arch. Maybe the scart jack rabbit scun from under. Us boys hoorayed and me and every noodle yelled Yankee Doodle. My, how we hawed and jeed the big ox sledges, hauling her long trunk through the hemlock dells, a bellerin to the tinkle tankle bells, and blunted our axe edges, hackin' new roads of ice alongside the rocky ledges. We stalled her twice, but gave the oxen spells, and yanked her through at last on the home clearin'. Lord, want we cheerin? Since then I've seen her born, as you might say, born out of fire and water and men sweatin, blast furnace rarin and red anvils frettin, and sawmills night and day, screech owlin like twas Satan's rum house run away, smellin o tar and pitch, but I'm forgettin the man that's primed her guns and paid her score the Commodore. McDonough, he's her master, and she knows his voice like he was talking to his hound. There ain't a man of her but rather drowned than tread upon his toes. And yet, with his red cheeks and twinkling eyes, a rose ain't friendlier than his looks be. When he's round, he makes you feel like you're a gentleman, American. But I must tell you, how we're hiding here. This otter crick is like a crook neck jug, and we're inside. The redcoats want to plug the mouth and cork our beer. So last week Downey sailed 
his British lake fleet near, to fill our channel. But us boys had dug big shore entrenchments, and our batteries stung em like bees, till they skedaddled whimperin' up the lake. But while the shots was flyin' in a scrimmage, I caught a ball that scotched my livin' image. Now, Jean, for Sam Hill's sake, don't let on this to mother, for you know she'd make a deary me in that would last a grim age. Tain't much, but when a feller goes to war, what's he go for if tain't to fight and take his chances? Jean stopped and looked down. The mother did not speak. Go on, said the old man. Flush tinged her cheek. Truly, I didn't mean. There ain't much more. He says. Goodbye now, little queen. We're due to sail for Plattsburgh this day week. Meantime, I'm hoping hard and taking stock. Your obedient jock. The girl's voice ceased in silence. Glitter, glitter. The shy wings flashed through blossom-colored leaves, and Phoebe, Phoebe, whistled from gray eaves through water shine and twitter and spurt of flamy green, but bane of thought is bitter. The mother's heart spurned May's sweet make-believes, for there, through falling masts and gaunt ships looming, guns, guns were booming. Plattsburgh and windless beauty on the bay, autumnal morning and the sun at seven. Southward, a wedge of wild ducks in the heaven dwindles, and far away, dim mountains watch the lake, where lurking for their prey lie with their muzzled thunders and pent levin the warships, Eagle, Preble, Saratoga, Ticonderoga. And now a little wind from the northwest flutters the trembling blue with snowy flecks. A gunner on McDonough's silent decks peers from his cannon's rest, staring beyond the low north headland. Crest on crest, behind green spruce tops, soft as wild fowl's necks, glide the bright spars and masts and whitened whales of bellying sails. Rounding, the British lake birds loom in view, ruffling their wings in silvery arrogance. Chubb, Linnet, Finch, and Lordly Confiance leading with Downey's crew the line. With long booms swung to starboard, they heave to, whistling their flock of galleys who advance behind, then toward the Yankees, four abreast, tack landward west. Landward, the watching townsfolk strew the shore. Mist banks of human beings blur the bluffs, and blacken the roofs like swarms of roosting chuffs. Waiting the cannon's roar, a nation holds its breath for knell of nevermore or peal of life. This hour shall cast the sloughs of generations and one old dame's joy, her gunner boy. One moment on the quarter-deck, Jock kneels beside his commodore and fighting squad. Their heads are bowed, their prayers go up toward God, toward God to whom appeals still rise in pain and mangling wrath from blind ordeals of man, still boastful of his brother's blood. They stand from prayer. Swift comes, and silently, the enemy. MacDonough holds his men, alert, devout. He that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind. Behold the ships that be, so great, are turned about even with a little helm. Jock tightens the blue clout around his waist, and watches casually close by a gamecock in a coop who stirs and spreads his spurs. Now bristling near, 
the British warbird swoop wings, and the Yankee eagle screams in fire. The English linnet answers, aiming higher, and crash along Jock's poop, her hurtling shot of iron crackles the gamecock's coop, where, lo, the ribald cock, like a town crier, strutting a gunslide, flaps to the cheering crew, Yankee doodle doo! Voice yell, and yapping laughter fills the roar. You bet we'll do em. You're a prophet, cocky. Hooray, old rooster. Hip, 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 cries jockey. Calmly, the commodore touches his cannon's fuse and fires a twenty-four. Smoke belches black. Huzzah! That's blowed em, pocky. And Downey's men, like pins before the bowling, fall, scatter rolling. Boom! flash the long guns, echoed by the galleys. The Confiance, wind-baffled in the bay, with both her port-bow anchors torn away, flutters, but proudly rallies to broadside, while her gunboats range the water alleys. Then Downey grips MacDonough in the fray, and double-shotted from his roaring flail, hurls the black hail. The hail turns red and drips in the hot gloom. Jock snuffs the reek and spits it from his mouth and grapples with great winds. The winds blow south, and scent of lilac bloom steals from his mother's porch in his still sleeping room. Lilacs. But now it stinks of blood and drouth. He staggers up and stares at blinding light. God, this is fight. Fight. The sharp loathing wretches in his loins. He gulps the black air like a drowner swimming where little round suns in a dance go rimming the dark with golden coins. Round him and round the splintering masts and jangled coins reel rattling, and overhead he hears the hymning, lonely and loud, of ululating choirs strangling with wires. Fight! But no more the roll of chanting drums, the fifing flare, the flags, and magic spume, filling his spirit with a wild perfume. Now noisome anguish numbs his sense, that mocks and leers at monstrous vacuums. Whang! splits the spanker near him, and the boom crushes MacDonough in a jumbled wreck, stunned on the deck. No time to glance where wounded leaders lie, or think on fallen sparrows in the storm, only to fight. The prone commander's form stirs, rises stumblingly, and gropes where, under shrieking grape and musketry, men's bodies womble like a mangled swarm of bees. He bends to sight his gun again, bleeding, and then... Oh, out of void and old oblivion and reptile slime first rose Apollo's head, and God, in likeness of himself, tis said, created such an one, now shaping Shakespeare's forehead, now Napoleon, various, by infinite invention bred, in his own image molding beautiful, the human skull. Jock lifts his head, MacDonald sights his gun to fire, but in his face a ball of flesh, a whizzing clod has hurled him in a mesh of tangled rope and ton, while still about the deck the lubber clod is spun, and bouncing from the rail lies in a plesh of oozing blood, upstaring, eyeless, red, a gunner's head. Above the ships, enormous from the lake, rises a wraith, a phantom dim and gory, lifting her wondrous limbs of smoke and glory, 
and little children quake, and lordly nations bow their foreheads for her sake. And bards proclaim her in their fiery story, and in her phantom breast, heartless, unheeding, hearts, hearts are bleeding. MacDonald lies with Downey in one land. Victor and vanquished long ago were peers, held in the grip of peace an hundred years. England has laid her hand in ours, and we have held and still shall hold the band that makes us brothers of the hemispheres, yea, still shall keep the lasting brotherhood of law and blood. Yet one whose terror racked us long of yore still wreaks upon the world her lawless might. Out of the deeps again the phantom fight looms on her wings of war, sowing in armed camps and fields her venomed spore, embattling monarch's whim against man's right, trampling with iron hooves the blooms of time back in the slime. We, who from dreams of justice dearly wrought, first rose in the eyes of patient Washington, and through the molten heart of Lincoln won to liberty forgot. Now standing lone in peace, mid Titans strange distraught, pray much for patience, more God's will be done, for vision and for power nobly to see the world made free. The Outlook Percy McKay End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Prophet by Lyman Bryson Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Jeremiah, will you come? Will you gather up the multitudes and wake them with a drum? Will you dare anoint the chosen ones from all the cattle kind, and threaten with the fire of God the foolish and the blind? Jeremiah, Jeremiah, we have waited for you long to see the flaming fury of your hate against the wrong. For we dally in the temple, and we flee the eye of truth, and we waste along the wilderness the glory of our youth. Jeremiah, Jeremiah, hear the lying prophets speak, hear they flatter in their feebleness the gilded and the sleek. But their languid pipings die in shame when trumpet cries are heard. Are you coming? Are you coming, O prophet of the word? The Forum, Lyman Bryson. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Newport by Alice Dewar Miller, read for LibriVox.org by Winifred Asman. On these brown rocks the waves dissolve in spray, as when our fathers saw them first a lee. If such a one could come again and see this ancient haven in its latter day, these haughty palaces and gardens gay, these dense soft lawns bedecked by many a tree, born like a gem from Ind or Araby, if he could see the race he bred at play, bright like a flock of tropic birds allured, to pause a moment on the southward wing, by these warm sands and by these summer seas, would he not cry, Alas, have I endured exile and famine, hate and suffering, to win religious liberty for these? Smart Set, Alice Dewar Miller. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To a Photographer 
by Burton Braley. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachok. I have known joy and woe and toil and fight. I have lived largely. I have dreamed and planned, and time, the sculptor, with a master hand, upon my face has wrought for all men's sight the lines and seams of life, of growth and blight, of struggle and of service and command. And now you show me this, this waxen, bland and placid face, unlined, untroubled, white this is not i this fatuous face you show retouched and prettified and smoothed to please put back the wrinkles and the lines i know i have spent blood and brain achieving these out of the pain the sorrow and the rack they are my scars of battle put them back Harper's Weekly, Burton Braley. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song by Edward J. O'Brien, read for LibriVox.org by Lori Banza. Flesh unto flowers and flame unto wind, the cleansing of showers shall come to thee blind in the night of thy sleeping the sound of the tide shall waken thee weeping to turn to my side boston transcript edward j o'brien end of poem this recording is in the public domain sonnet thirty seven by arthur davison fick Read for LibriVox.org by Daniel Silverman Through vales of Thrace, Penis's stream is flowing Past legend-peopled hillsides to the deep From Pestum's rose-hung plain, soft winds are blowing The halls of amber lie in haunted sleep The Cornish sea is silent with the summer That one spore isolt from the Irish shore and lovely, lone Fiesole is dumber than when Lorenzo's garland guests it wore. This eve for us the emerald clearness glowing over the stream, where late was ruddy might, whispers a wonder, dumb to other knowing, known but to you the silence and the night. Our boat drifts breathless, the last light is dying, stars, dawn, shall find us here together lying the forum arthur davison fick end of poem this recording is in the public domain the hunting of diane by george sterling read for LibriVox.org by alan mapstone in the silence of a midnight lost, lost for evermore, I stood upon a nameless beach where none had been before, and red gold and yellow gold were the shells upon that shore. Lone, lone it was as a mist-enfolded strand, set round a lake where marble demons stand, held like a sapphire stone in Thibet's monstrous hand and there i beheld how one stood in her grace to hold to the stars her wet and fairy face and on the smooth and haunted sands her footfall had no trace white white was she as the youngest seraph's word or milk of eden's kine or eden's fragrant curd cast in love by eve's wan hand to her most snowy bird fair fair was she as venus of the sky and the jasmine of her breast and the starlight of her eye made the heart a pain and the soul a hopeless sigh weak with the sight i leaned upon my sword 
till my soul that had sighed was become an unseen chord for stress of music rendered to unknown things adored surely she heard but her beauty gave no sign to me for whom the hushed sea was odorous as wine to me for whom the voiceless world was made her silent shrine and she sent forth her gaze to the waters of the west and she sent forth her soul to the islands of the blest below a star whose silver throws set pearls upon her breast but chill in the east break a glory on the lands and she moaned like some low wave that dies on frozen sands and held to her sea lover sweet and cruel hands then rose the moon and its lance was in her side and there was bitter music because in woe she cried ere on the hard and gleaming beach she laid her down and died i leapt to her succour my sword i left behind but one low mound of opal foam was all that i could find a moon-washed length of airy gems that trembled in the wind i knelt below the stars the sea put forth a wave the moon drew up the captive tides upon her shining grave as far away i heard the cry her dim sea lover gave smart set george sterling end of poem this recording is in the public domain the fireman's ball by vachel lindsay a collaborative reading for LibriVox.org. Reader 1, read by Red Run. Reader 2, read by Bruce Kachuk. Reader 3, read by Newgate Novelist. Reader 4, Larry Wilson. Section 1. Give the engines room, give the engines room! Louder! faster the little bandmaster whips up the fluting hurries up the tooting he thinks that he stands the reins in his hands in the fire chief's place in the night alarm chase the cymbals whang the kettle drums bang clear the street clear the street clear the street boom boom in the evening gloom in the evening gloom give the engines room give the engines room let souls be trapped in a terrible tomb the sparks and the pine brands whirl on high from the black and reeking alleys to the wide red sky. Hear the hot glass crashing, hear the stone steps hissing. Coal black streams from the gutters pour. There are cries for help from a far fifth floor. For a longer ladder, hear the fire chief call. Listen to the music of the fireman's ball. Tis the night of doom, say the ding dong doom bells night of doom say the ding dong doom bells faster faster the red flames come hum grum say the engines hum grum grum buzz buzz says the crowd see see calls the crowd look out yelps the crowd and the high walls fall listen to the music of the fireman's ball listen to the music of the fireman's ball tis the night of doom say the ding dong doom bells night of doom say the ding dong doom bells wangaranga wangaranga wang 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 Clang, clang, clangaranga. Clang, clang, clang. Clangaranga. Clangaranga. Clang, clang. Listen to the music of the firemen's ball. Section 2 Many's the heart that's breaking, if we could read them all, 
after the ball is over, an old song. Scornfully, gaily, the bandmaster sways, changing the strain that the wild band plays. With a red and royal intoxication, a tangle of sounds and a syncopation, sweeping and bending from side to side, master of dreams with a peacock pride, the lord of the delicate flowers of delight, he drives compunction back through the night, dreams he's a soldier plumed and spurred, and valiant lads arise at his word, flaying the sober thoughts he hates, driving them back from the dream town gates. How can the languorous dancers know the red dreams come when the good dreams go? Tis the night of love, call the silver joy bells. Night of love, call the silver joy bells. Honey and wine, honey and wine. Sing low now, violins. Sing, sing low, blow gently, woodwind, mellow and slow. Like midnight poppies the sweethearts bloom. Their eyes flash power, their lips are dumb. Faster and faster their pulses come. Though softer now the drum beats fall. Honey and wine, honey and wine. Tis the fireman's ball, tis the fireman's ball. I am slain, cries true love there in the shadow. And I die, cries true love. They're laid low. When the fire dreams come, the wise dreams go. But his cry is drowned by the proud bandmaster, and now great gongs wang sharper, faster, and kettle drums rattle and hide the shame with a swish and a swirk in dead love's name. Red and crimson and scarlet and rose. Magical poppies, the sweethearts bloom. The scarlet stays when the rose flush goes, and love lies low in a marble tomb. Tis the night of doom, called the ding dong doom bells. Night of doom, called the ding dong doom bells. Hark how the piccolos still make cheer. Tis a moonlight night in the spring of the year. Clang a ranga, clang a ranga, clang, clang, clang. Clang a ranga, clang a ranga, clang, clang, clang. Listen to the music. Of the fireman's ball. Listen to the music of the fireman's ball. Section 3. In which, contrary to artistic custom, the moral of the piece is placed before the reader. From the first Khandaka of the Mahavaga. There Buddha thus addressed his disciples, Everything, O mendicants, is burning. With what fire is it burning? I declare unto you it is burning with the fire of passion, with the fire of anger, with the fire of ignorance. It is burning with the anxieties of birth, decay, and death, grief, lamentation, suffering, and despair. A disciple, becoming weary of all that, divests himself of passion. By absence of passion, 
he is made free. I once knew a teacher who turned from desire, who said to the young men, Wine is a fire, who said to the merchants, Gold is a flame that sears and tortures if you play at the game. I once knew a teacher who turned from desire, who said to the soldiers, Hate is a fire, who said to the statesmen, Power is a flame that flays and blisters if you play at the game. I once knew a teacher who turned from desire, who said to the lordly, Pride is a fire, who thus warned the revelers, Life is a flame, be cold as the dew, would you win at the game with hearts like the stars? With hearts like the stars, so beware, so beware, so beware of the fire. Clear the streets, boom, boom, clear the streets, boom, boom. Give the engines room, give the engines room, lest souls be trapped in a terrible tomb. Says the swift white horse to the swift black horse, there goes the alarm, there goes the alarm. They are hitched, they are off, they are gone in a flash, and they strain at the driver's iron arm. Clanga, ranga, clanga, ranga, clang, clang, clang. Clanga, ranga, clanga, ranga, clang, clang, clang. Clanga, ranga, clanga, ranga, clang, clang, clang. Poetry, a magazine of verse. Vachel Lindsay. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Summons by Louis Untermeyer. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. The eager night and the impetuous winds, the hints and whispers of a thousand lures, and all the swift persuasion of the spring surged from the stars and stones and swept me on. The smell of honeysuckles, keen and clear, startled and shook me with the sudden thrill of some well-known but half-forgotten voice. A slender stream became a naked sprite, flashed around curious bends and winked at me, beyond the turns, alert and mischievous. A saffron moon dangling among the trees seemed like a toy balloon caught in the boughs, flung there in sport by some too mirthful breeze. And as it hung there, vivid and unreal, the whole world's lethargy was brushed away. The night kept tugging at my torpid mood and tore it into shreds. A warm air blew my wintry slothfulness beyond the stars. And over all indifference there streamed a myriad urges in one rushing wave, touched with the lavish miracles of earth. I felt the brave persistence of the grass, the far desire of rivulets, the keen unconquerable fervor of the thrush, the endless labors of the patient worm, the lichen strength, the prowess of the ant, the constancy of flowers, the blind belief of ivy climbing slowly toward the sun, the eternal struggles and eternal deaths, and yet the groping faith of every root. Out of old graves arose the cry of life. Out of the dying came the deathless call, and thrilling with a new sweet restlessness, the thing that was my boyhood woke in me. Dear foolish fragments made me strong again. Valiant adventures, dreams of those to come, and all the vague heroic hopes of youth, with fresh abandon like a fearless laugh, leaped up to face the heavens unconcern and then veil upon veil was torn aside stars like a host of merry girls and boys danced gaily round me plucking at my hand the night scorning its ancient mystery leaned down and pressed new courage in my heart the hermit thrush throbbing with more song sang with a happy challenge to the skies love and the faces of a world of children swept like a conquering army through my blood and beauty rising out of all its forms beauty the passion of the universe flamed with its joy a thing too great for tears and like a wine poured itself out for me to drink of to be warmed with 
and to go refreshed and strengthened to the ceaseless fight to meet with confidence the sinecures battling in wars that never can be won seeking the lost cause and the brave defeat century louis untermeyer end of poem this recording is in the public domain patterns by james oppenheim read for librivox by diana lee would you lay a pattern on life and say thus shall ye live i tell you that is a denial of life i say that thus we pour our spirits in a mold and they cake and die i want to go to the man who quickens me i want the gift of life the flame of his spirit eating along the tender of my heart I want to feel the floodgates within flung open and the tides pouring through me. I want to take what I am and bring it to fruit. Quicken me and I will grow. Touch me with flame and the blossoms will open and the fruit appear. Call forth in me a creator and the God will answer. And then, if I commit what you call a sin, better so. It will not be a sin. It will be a mere breaking of your patterns. For the only sin is death, and the only virtue to be altogether alive and your own authentic self. Century James Oppenheim End of poem This recording is in the public domain. New York by Edwin Davies Schoonmaker Read for LibriVox.org by Jonathan Jones Sea-rimmed and teeming with millions Poured out on thy granite shore Surge upon surge, many nationed O city far famed for the roar Of thy cavernous iron streets And thy towers half hung in the sun Rising in layer on layer, twelve cities piled upon one, all feeding and sleeping and breeding, enormous half palace, half den, with ever a tide washing through thee, whose clamouring waters are men. Oh, where is the hand of thy builder? What God, canst thou tell, hath his hand on the clay of thy face? Or oh, what demon from hell? I have viewed the eye of the stranger, And the pride of the new world man, The mountainous leap of thy glory, The miles of thy endless span. And my heart has gone up with thy towers, And my love has fallen as dew, On thy night-blooming lamps in rows, On thy beautiful avenue. I have stood with the seaman's glass on the roofs of thy high hotels. I have rolled through the sheer ravines where the cliff dweller dwells. I have peered from the place to the tomb far up where the hills break free. And the length of the lordly river comes down as a bride to the sea. I have fled with a roar through the rock where the myriad lights flash by. I have heard the song of the soaring steel come down from the sky. I have watched as a lover thy waters, all mottled with cloud and with sun, where the ocean comes in to caress thee, O oh, beautiful one. And the days and the years of my life are a gift unto thee, and I dwell in thy marvellous gates. O goddess cast up by the sea. I have surged for the morning throng Down the gulf of the great white way That gashes thy granite length From the towers of sleep to the bay. When the west rolls in with a rush And the north comes down with a roar And the tramp of the island men Is loud on thy island shore. Shoulder to shoulder they come from the loins of a hundred lands, the men with the new world brains, 
and the men with the old world hands. And the vision is bright on the sky of the city to be, and the joy of the morning is there, and the thrill of the sea. As the surf is the sound of thy labour, O city, as wine, is the hum of thy human streets filled with faces divine. When from building on populous building, thy power unfurled, leaps down to the sea and off through the air to the ends of the world. I have loafed round the banging wharfs where the foreign freighters lie. I have watched the bridge-weaving shuttles pass over the sky. I felt the quick leap of thy drills where the builders of Rome swing the rock from the hole in the ground for the walls of thy home. I have heard far down through the canyons the clamour and yell when the brokers are out with their signs and the curb is a hell. I have sounded thy chattering markets. I have watched the noon hour come over thy tolling miles with the slack of thy terrible power when story on story lets out on the pavement below and thy streets are a swarm with a jewel and the parks overflow. Far famed is the rustling hour when the shoppers flow in. For miles thy walks are a bloom, and the monstrous fairs begin. And the aisles of the merchants are crowded, and dark-faced boys are out on the corners with flowers, and vacuers are there with their toys. I have paused with the passing throng, with the hoyden sea winds whirls, and whisks round the tall grey towers the skirts of the laughing girls. I have watched round the wonder of windows the beauty and grace. I have breasted the streaming throngs, and have come to the quiet place of the fountain, and weary with tramping have lounged on the benches there, with the homeless man of the streets, the man with the unkempt hair, hath given him soul for soul, as we watch far up in the skies, the just-seen worker wave and the slab of marble rise to its place on the fortieth floor, still lit by the sun, is the face of the golden clock when the toil of the day is done. Then the long grey miles are a murmur, and the builders come down from the sky, and speed throws her myriad shuttles, and the ambulance hurries by. And the foam of the evening paper is white on the living sea, and the deep defiles are black with men as far as the eye can see. And loaded trains rush north and west from thy mighty central heart, and the rivers foam and the bridges sag till the strong steel cables start. And the rock drinks in its thousands, from the moving flood in the street, as a strong male tide goes out with the roar of a million feet. I know when the night comes down that a beautiful siren awakes. I've seen the flash of her eyes and the light that her shadow makes on the rain wet avenue when the flutes of pleasure are heard, and she dances her way to the wine cup and sings like a bird. Hand in hand go the sons of youth, and the daughters of beauty divine, and the children of hunger are there who have trodden the grapes of their wine, and the thousands pour and pour through the huge illumined fair, and the booths of a hundred lands are bright, and the wonder worker is there. The red star is out on the roof, and the horses are off on the wall, and the girl and the dog are blown along, and the flashing waterfall. And the flush of thy far-flung revel goes up to the ribbons of sky, and the forgotten Orion sinks down, and the Pleiades die. I have trailed down the pleasant river, I have trampled where the iron elves go thundering down through the haunts of care, I have slummed through the hidden hells, I have jostled the mingling bari, where the stream of the races rolls. I know the town where the yellow man goes by on his velvet soles. I've threaded the still dark canyons, 
where the clustered towers rise. Not a foot is heard of the thousands, they are ghosts on the midnight skies. I've seen all the clamour of waters, thy piles upon shadowy piles, standing out on the canvas of night, and the twinkling for miles and upon miles. As the grail is the gleam of thy towers, and the glow of the great white way, and a thousand ships have sailed and sailed to the lure of the lights on the bay. And the spell of thy song, O Enchantress, is sweet on the southern air. And the shepherd far out on the plains feels the sting of thy hair. Thou art young with the youth of them, strong with the strength of them, filled with the beauty of girls. Thy throat, where the river gleams, is beaded with lamps as with pearls. And the languor of night is around thee, and the waters rise and fall. And over invisible bridges slow fireworms crawl. And the fairies that glide o'er the bay, or the river that lave, the feet of thy emerald towers are lighted swans on the wave. As Merlin had walked o'er thy waters, or Prospero's eye were watching alternate old cities line out on the sky. One moment Jerusalem gleams, and thy towers are holy and white, and glow at the turn of a glass, old Babylon etched on the night, with high summer gardens abloom, and the wealth of the world in her hair. Then Carnival laughs in thy streets, and Cairo is there, barbaric all over with brooches, and fountains of fire, till the new day quenches the lamps, and flares over tire. The Smart Set, Edwin Davis Shoemaker. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. We Dead by James Oppenheim. Read for LibriVox.org by Red Run. When from the brooding home, the silent, immemorial love house, the beloved body of the mother in her travail, naked the little one comes and wails at the world's bleak weather, we say that on earth and to us a child has been born. But now we move with unhalting pace toward the dark evening, and toward the cold, lengthening shadow and quick we avert our fearful eyes from the strange event, the burial and the born, that leaving home, the end, death. Are these, then, birth and death? Does the cut of a cord bring life, and dust to dust expunge it? If so, what are we, then, we dead? For in the cities and dark on the lonely farms, and waifs on the ocean, as a harrying of wind, as an eddying of dust, we dead in our soft shining bodies that are combed and are kissed, are ghosts fleeing from the inescapable hell of ourselves. We are even as beetles skating over the waters of our own darkness, even as beetles darting and restless, but the depths dark and void, we have found no peace, no peace, though our engines are crafty. What avail wings to the flyer in the skies, while his dead soul, like an anchor, drags on the earth? And what avails lightning, darting a man's voice, linking the cities, while in the booth he is the same varnished clod, and his soul flies not after? And what avails it that the body of man has waxed mammoth, limbed with the lightning and the stream, while his spirit remains a torment and a trifle, and, gaining the world, profits nothing? Self-murdered, self-slain, the dead cumber the earth. And how did they die? A boy was born in the pouring radiance of creative magic, and with pulses of music he was born— 
Of himself he might have been shaping a song-winged poet, but he was afraid. He feared the gaunt garret of starvation and the lonely years in his soul's desert, and he feared to be a jest and a fool before his friends. Now he clerks, the slave, and the magic is slimed with disastrous opiates of the night. A girl was bathed with the lissom beauty of the seeker of love, the call of the animals one to another in spring, the desire of the captive woman in her heart as she ran and leaped on the hills. But the imprisoned beast's cry terrified her as she looked out over the love-quiet of the modern world. Yet she desired to take this man-lure and release it into loveliness, become a dancer, lulling with witchcraft of her young body the fevered world. But, no, her mother spied here a wickedness. Shamefully, she submitted, making a smoldering inferno of the hidden nymph in her soul, and so died. A woman was made body and heart, for the beautiful love-life. But of the mother miracle, how the cry of a troubled child whitens the red passions, she did not know. Fear of poverty corrupted her. She chose a fool that her heart hated, and now through him no release for her native passions, but only a spending of her loathsome fury on adornment and luxury. Ah, dead glory, and the heart sick with betrayal. There is no grace for the dead, save to be born again. Engines shall not drag us from the grave, nor wine nor meat revive us. For our thirst is a thirst no liquor can reach or slake, and our hunger a hunger by no bread filled. The waters we crave bubble up from the springs of life, and the bread we would break comes down from invisible hands. We dead, awake, kiss the beloved past goodbye, go leave the love-house of the betrayed self, and through the dark of birth go and enter the soul, the soul's bleak winter. And I, I will not stay dead, though the dead cling to me. I will put away the kisses and the soft embraces and the walls that encompass me, and out of this womb I will surely move to the world of my spirit. I will lose my life to find it, as of old. Yea, I will turn from the life lie I lived to the truth I was wrought for. And I will take the Creator within, sower of the seed of the race, and make him a god, a shaper of civilization. Now, on my soul's imperious surge, taking the risk as of death, and in deepening twilight, I ride on the darkening flood and go out on the waters, till over the tide comes music, till over the tide the breath of the song of my far-off soul is wafted and blown, murmuring commandments. Storm and darkness, I am drowned in the torrent. I am moving forth irrevocably from the sheltering womb. I am naked and little. O oh, cold of the world, and light blinding, and space terrifying, now my cry goes up, and the wailing of my helpless soul, Mother, my mother! Lo, then, the mother eternal, in my opening soul the footfall of her fleeting tread, and the song of her voice piercing and sweet with love of me, and the enwinding of her arms and adoring of her breath and the milk of her plenty. O oh, life of which I am part, life from the depths of the heavens that ascended like a water spring into David of Asia in the eastern hills in the night, that came like a noose of golden shadow on Joan in the orchard, that gathers all life, the binding of brothers into sheaves, that of old kneelers in the dust named glorying Allah. Jehovah God. Century, James Oppenheim. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
God and the Farmer by Frederick Erastus Pierce Read for LibriVox.org by Carrie Adams Your Book Voice On the 11th of December, 2022 At Mesa, Arizona God and the Farmer God sat down with the farmer When the noontide heat grew harsh The one had builded a world that day and the other had drained a marsh. They sat in the cooling shadow at the porch of the templed wood, and each looked forth on his handiwork and saw that the work was good. On God's right hand two cherubs bent waiting, winged with fire. On the farmer's left his oxen bowed, deep bosoms marked with mire still clung around the plowshare the dark mysterious mold where the furrow it turned had heaved the new or the chill and curlish old jehovah's face was not seen by ox or grazing kine but the farmer's eyes were they dazed with sun or saw he that look divine was it the wind in passing that stroked the farmer's hair? Or had God's own hand of wind and flame laid benediction there? Through muffling miles he fancied far calls of greeting blue, where on sounding plains the lords of war hurled down to rear anew. Glad hail from nation builders crossed faint those dreamland bounds, like a brother's cry from a distant hill, and God spake as the pine tree sounds. There are seven downy meadows that never before were mown. There were seven fields of brush and rock where now is nor bush nor stone. There are seven heifers grazing where but one could graze before. O lords of marts, and of broken hearts, what have you given me more? God rose up from the farmer when the cool of the evening neared, and the one went forth through the worlds he built, and the one through the fields he cleared. The stars outlasting labor leaned down o'er the flowering soil and all night long o'er his child there leaned a toiler more old than toil yale review frederick erastus pierce end of poem this recording is in the public domain Song by Ruth Guthrie Harding Read for LibriVox.org by Lori Banza O oh, shadows past the candle gleam, so brief to pause in flight, Are shadows that can come no more still moving unseen on the door of yesternight? O oh, roses on the crumbling wall, so soon to droop and die, are any roses that are dead still fragrant where their petals bled in June's gone by? O oh, heart of mine, there is a face nor grief nor prayer can bring. Think you in some far shadow land one keeps my roses in his hand? Remembering? Boston Transcript, Ruth Guthrie Harding End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Surety by Witter Binner. Read for LibriVox by Deanna Lee. We have each other's deathless love, a love that flies on wings of light from star to star and sings above the night. We bid each other's eyes reveal the face whose images we are. We find each other's hand upon the wheel, piloting every star. Shall we then watch with a less lonely breath, gradual, sudden, everlasting death? O oh, lest a separating wind assail, the jocund stars and all their ways be dearth, 
and love, undone, of its immense avail, go homeless even on earth. Let us be constant, though we travel far, with every mortal token of our trust, and not forget, piloting any star, how dear a thing is dust. Yale Review, Witter Binner End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Remembrance, Greek Folk Song by Margaret Widmer, read for LibriVox.org by Red Run. Not unto the forest, not unto the forest, O oh my lover, why do you lead me to the forest? Joy is where the temples are, lines of dancers swinging far, drums and lyres and viols in the town. It is dark in the forest and the flapping leaves will blind me, and the clinging vines will bind me, and the thorny rose-boughs tear my saffron gown, and I fear the forest. Not unto the forest, not unto the forest, O oh my lover. There was one once who led me to the forest. Hand in hand we wandered mute, where was neither lyre nor flute, Little stars were bright against the dusk. There was wind in the forest. And the thicket of wild rose breathed across our lips locked close dizzy perfumings of spikenard and musk. I am tired of the forest. Not unto the forest, not unto the forest, O oh my lover. Take me from the silence of the forest. I will love you by the light and the beat of drums at night, and echoing of laughter in my ears. But here in the forest I am still remembering a forgotten useless thing, and my eyelids are locked down for fear of tears. There is memory in the forest. The Craftsman, Margaret Widmer. End of Poem this recording is in the public domain. The Two Flames by Eloise Britton Read for LibriVox.org by Daniel Silverman Behind my mask of life there lies a shrine wherein two flames are burning. Day and night I tend these leaping treasures that are mine these lambent loves, the red one and the white, while, priestess-like, I hang at either glow, for each is perfect, and to each I bring the oil of pure emotion, hottest so, and draw new strength from my own offering. The first of these, my loves, burns as a star that lifts its keen white glory into space with virgin fervor, lavishing afar its vivid purity, and in the face of changeful worlds it glows unaltered still. So burns my flame of friendship. In its sight all things are silvered with a new delight, and beauty's self strikes deeper till the thrill of mere existence vibrates like a string. Then life is grown so taut that it must sing, and all the little hills must clap their hands. The soul is free, as never bird on wing, to bathe in friendship like a sea of light, and ever as it mounts the sea expands in new infinities, and each new height grows keener than the last, until the mind, for very dizziness, sweeps downward then to simpler things. The cadence of a voice, or sweet low laughter idle as the wind, or fleeting touch of hands that quick rejoice, but ask, no more, and do not touch again. With this white flame there comes a strange new peace, a deep tranquility unknown beside, where all my life's cross-currents shift and cease like runways in the sand before the tide, and all that I have longed to be, the brave high dreams of youth that languished nigh forgot, seem half accomplished, Easy now to slave at tasks colossal, so my friend fail not, 
and I am filled with gentle wonderment that life can be so good and breath so sweet, while all my worlds grow suddenly complete, that I must love it with a new content. So speech grows overfull, and we are fain to drink of silence like a golden cup with wine of sweet companionship filled up that has no end, nor any thirst can drain. And so at last, no wish is left to me save thus to dream into eternity. This is my first white love. The second flame burns red and fierce as noontime on the earth, a wild, full-blooded love that sprang to birth, naked and unafraid, yet scorning shame, and clean as winds that sweep the desert's breast. My flame of passion this, born of the sun and warm red earth so eon long ago, in languid, throbbing noons when dust was pressed to amorous dust and longing made it one. This is a good love too, and must be so, though bloodless fathers crushed it and denied, and on a cross of virtue crucified this firm sweet flesh that colors with our soul. Aye, it is good and beautiful and clean to feel within my veins the surge and flow of young desire waking that the whole warm universe has felt to call and preen and dance before my mate that he may know an answering surge and leap and make me his and glad with every fecund thing that is God, it is good to feel the primal cry, the deep, mad longing for another life, my life and his, that shall be born of me, a little child of flame, that when we die we may cheat time, nor perish in the strife. But in this hour of vital ecstasy, when life is molten, we may stamp thereon our own glad image, and conceive, and live. And sweet it is, and languid, when the tide has ebbed, for lack of more than I can give, to take his hand who breathes so close beside, and lay it on my breast, and humble me to say, Thou art my Lord, thy will my own. So at the last this wish is mine, to be struck at the high tide into nothingness, to die ere he can learn to love me less. So these my loves are perfect, each alone sufficient in itself and all complete, yet one of two like rival beacons shown that call and call me, but that never meet. For yet they have not met, nor ever burned the white flame in the red, the red in white, till both were wed together there and turned to some half-dreamed intensity of light? For I have dreamed. Yes, in my priestess soul the longing grows for one great altar fire that shall leap up to heaven a winged desire, not two but one, a perfect, living, whole. Is this a dream? Are all great lovers' dreams? Can red and white be fused, or two be one? Isolt and Eloise, are they but themes whereon men hang the yearnings they have spun? And must I cherish so till the end's end my sweet love's sundered, lover here, or friend? Nay, I know not. I guard by day and night my leaping flames, the red one and the white. The Forum, Eloise Britton. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Look by Sarah Teasdale. Read for LibriVox by Deanna Lee. Strephon kissed me in the spring, Robin in the fall, but Colin only looked at me 
and never kissed at all. Strephon's kiss was lost in jest. Robin's lost in play. But the kiss in Colin's eyes haunts me night and day. Harper's Magazine, Sarah Teasdale End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Flirt by Amelia Josephine Burr Read for LibriVox.org by Lee Vogler Beautiful boy, lend me your youth to play with. My heart is old. Lend me your fire to make my twilight gay with, to warm my cold. Prove that the power my look has not forsaken, that at my will my touch can quicken pulses and awaken man's passion still. The moment that I ask, do not begrudge me. I shall not stay. I shall have gone, ere you have time to judge me, my empty way. I am not worth remembrance, little brother, even to damn. One kiss. Oh, God, if I were only other than what I am. Century, Amelia Josephine Burr. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Young Eden by Witter Binner. Read for LibriVox.org by Novacoms VO. Flushed from a fairy flagon, my country love and I sat by a bush forgetting old conscience and his fretting, just dreaming there and letting trouble trundle by, like a dragon dead on a wagon, drawn against the sky. Foldy roll de ralio, trouble in the sky. She knew it was only a cloud I saw when I pointed out a dangling claw, but she let me say my say for the day. Red Ripe was a pretty day, and she thought my way was a city way. And oh, I liked her thinking, while each unhindered curl glinted in the sunlight, hinted of its yellow, that I who spoke to such a girl was something of a fellow. Full de roll de ralio, was she really thinking so? There's the tree, I gaily told her, apples, apples at our feet. Come, before we're one day older, we shall gather, we shall eat. Now's the time for apple hunger, not if we were one day younger. Younger, older, shyer, bolder, would an apple taste so sweet? Full de roll de ralio, apples at our feet. Bewildered, she was with me on the run, toward the tree that held its treasure to the sun. This, of all the trees of treasure, was the one, condemning leisure and inviting lovely pleasure. She was with me, she was by me on the run, with a cheek that turned its treasure to the sun. Full de roll de ralio, ralio we gaily go, full. Why should she stop and never speak? Why should the color in her cheek change, not glowing gay and meek? Deeper, redder than I knew, she was mistress of a hue, though demurely, richly, surely, rising in her cheek. Full de roll de ralio, the change in her cheek. There was before us on the ground, eyes upon us, not a sound, sat a neighbor's truant child of seven years. Her lap was full of sunny gold, but her eyes in the sun, her eyes were old, were sober, seeming laden, and such a little maiden, unawares but laden with some dead woman's tears. Full de roll de ralio, a child of seven years. Some woman who had watched and wept, but had not any speech, watched and wept now within that little breast, caught and caressed those little hands, and would have kept beyond their reach the anguish in that orchard, the apple bough unblessed, the brightness that had tortured the heart within the breast. And we beheld, and see it even now, a bent and withered apple bough of beauty dispossessed, which bore its poison long ago. Oh, why we pluck it still, we may not know, but only that it leaves no rest to the heart within the breast. Foldy roll de ralio, this heart within the breast. Abashed and parting on our ways, we saw that woman's poor dead hand, ghostly making its demand. 
fall pitiful and sad. We saw the child, forgetful of our gaze, laughing like any child that plays and laughs in any land, lean and touch a toy she had half hidden in her hand. We saw her pat and poise and raise, an apple in her hand. Foldy roll, de ralio, the apple in her hand. Yale Review, Witter Binner. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Evolution by John Myers O'Hara, read for LibriVox.org, by Hope. Thus drowsy at this, laughing at my door. Sapo, I vow that I will kiss no more. Thy lips in every loveliness, if thou shouldst still refuse to bear thy beauty now. O oh, from thy bed unloosen every charm, of all thy strength, beloved in limb and arm. And doff thy robe and bathe thee as the white, lily that leaves the river for the light. And Cleus on thee, at thy glowing call, a shimmering robe of saffron shall let fall. And we, thy girlfriends, in a vestral throng, shall wreath thy hair while thirsting for thy song. Smart Set, John Myers O'Hara. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pilgrimage by Laura Campbell. Read by Jonathan Jones I will tread on the golden grass of my bright field When the passion star has paled, when the night has fled I will tread on the golden grass of my bright field In the glow of the early day, when the east is red In my bright field a broken beech tree leans And a giant boulder stands by a black burned wood and a rough-built falling wall and a rotting door, sear like a scar the spot where a house once stood. My eyes are mute on the white edge of the dawn, my feet fall swift and bare upon the way. The long, soft hills grow black against the sky, the great wood moves, unfolds, the high trees sway. The worn road stretches thin, and the low hedge stirs, and a strong old bridge looms frail o'er a ghostly stream, and a white flower turns and breathes and turns again. Does it live as I live? Does it wake as I waked from a dream? How merciless is the dawn! How poignant the hush in my soul! How changeless the changing sky! How fearful that wild bird's call! I hear the quick suck of his wing, the push of his breast. He is gone. How swift is the neon of time! How endless, beginningless all! I tread on the golden grass of my bright field. The sun's on a hundred hills, the night has fled. I tread on the golden grass of my bright field, in the glow of the early day, and the east is red. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ballad of Two Seas by George Stirling Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Wherefore thy woe these many years, O hermit by the sea? What is the grief that winds awake, And waters cry to thee? It was in piracy we sailed, Great galleons to strip. On a far day, on a far sea, We took her father's ship. Red-sided rocked the radel, sir, When as its deck we won, I slew before her eyes divine her father and his son. There was no sin I had not sinned on deep sea and ashore, but when I looked in those great eyes, villain was I no more. I, captain, claimed her as my prize, though maids in common were. Alone midst that fell company, I cast my lot with her. They put us in an open boat, with four days' food and drink. 
then slip those traitor topsails down beyond the ocean's brink night came and morn but rose no sail on that horizon verge i took the oars and set our prow against the lessening surge it was scant provender we had though she was unaware right soon i feared and by deceit i gave her all my share she would not speak she scarce would look her pain was past my cure red scuppered in our hells of dream wallowed the ray del sur on a far day on a far sea our shallop southward crept with weary arms and splitten lips i laboured and she wept dawn upon dawn dark upon dark nor ever land nor wind the nights were chill the stars were keen the sun swung hot and blind our drink and food were long since gone we laid us down to die then came a booming of the surf and palm trees met mine eye i steered us through the broken reef fainting i won to shore i gazed upon her changed face but she on mine no more below the palms i buried her whose bale star i had been and since by this bleak coast of snows i sorrow for my sin there was no other of our kind that had her heavenly face on a far day by a far sea i trust to know her grace smart set george sterling end of poem this recording is in the public domain Eros Turanos by Edwin Arlington Robinson Read for LibriVox by Deanna Lee She fears him and will always ask What fated her to choose him? She meets in his engaging mask All reasons to refuse him But what she meets and what she fears Are less than are the downward years Drawn slowly to the foamless weirs of age were she to lose him between a blurred sagacity that once had power to sound him and love that will not let him be the seeker that she found him her pride assuages her almost as if it were alone the cost he sees that he will not be lost and waits and looks around him a sense of ocean and old trees envelops and allures him tradition touching all he sees beguiles and reassures him and all her doubts of what he says are dimmed with what she knows of days till even prejudice delays and fades and she secures him the falling leaf inaugurates the reign of her confusion the pounding wave reverberates the crash of her illusion and home, where passion lived and died, becomes a place where she can hide, while all the town and harbor side vibrate with her seclusion. We tell you, tapping on our brows, the story as it should be, as if the story of a house were told or ever could be. We'll have no kindly veil between her visions and those we have seen, as if we guessed what hers have been or what they are or would be meanwhile we do no harm for they that with a god have striven not hearing much of what we say take what the god has given though like waves breaking it may be or like a changed familiar tree or like a stairway to the sea where down the blind are driven Poetry, a magazine of verse. Edwin Arlington Robinson. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Shroud by Edna St. Vincent Millay. 
Read for LibriVox.org by Hope. Death, I say, my heart is bowed unto thine, O mother. This red gown will make a shroud good as any other. I that would not wait to wear my own bridal things in a dress dark as my hair made my answer rings. I tonight that till he came could not wait in a gown as bright as flame held for them the gate. Death, I say, my heart is bowed unto thine, O mother. This red gown will make a shroud good as any other. The Forum Edna St. Vincent Millay End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Mother by Lydia Gibson Read for LibriVox.org by Deanna Lee Never again to feel that little kiss, that hungry kiss, that heavy little head, pressing and groping, eager to be fed. My breast is burning with the weight of this, my arms are empty, and my heart is dead. Through the long nights never to hear the cry, the little cry that called me from my sleep, always from now a vigil black to keep, always awake and listening to lie, while over my seared heart the ashes heap. Ah, God, there is no God, there is no rest, no rest, no pity, no release from pain. How could God give those little hands again? How could God cool the throbbing of my breast? Oh, little hands that in the dust have lain. The Masses Lydia Gibson End of poem This recording is in the public domain. A Handful of Dust by James Oppenheim Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone I stooped to the silent earth and lifted a handful of her dust. Was it a handful of humanity I held? Was it the crumbled and blown beauty of a woman or a babe? For over the hills of earth blows the dust of the withered generations, and not a water drop in the sea, but was once a blood drop or a tear, and not an atom of sap in leaf or bud, but was once the love sap in a human being, and not a lump of soil, but was once the rosy curve of lip or breast or cheek handful of dust you stagger me i did not dream the world was so full of the dead and the air i breathe so rich with the bewildering past kiss of what girls is on the wind whisper of what lips is in the cup of my hand cry of what deaths is in the break of the wave tossed by the sea I am enfolded in an air of rushing wings. I am engulfed in clouds of love lives gone. Who leans yonder, Helen of Greece? Who walks with me? Isolde? The trees are shaking down the blossoms from Juliet's breast, and the bee drinks honey from the lips of David. Come, girl, my comrade. Stand close, sun-tanned one, with your bright eyes lifted. Behold this dust. This is you. This of the earth under your feet is you. Raised by what miracle? Shaped by what magic? Breathed in two by what god? And a hundred years hence, one like myself may come, and stoop, and take a handful of the yielding earth, and never dream that in his palm lies she that laughed and ran and lived beside this sea on an afternoon a hundred years before. Listen to the dust in this hand. 
who is trying to speak to us century james oppenheim end of poem this recording is in the public domain a linmouth widow by amelia josephine burr read for librivox by deanna lee he was straight and strong and his eyes were blue as the summer meeting of sky and sea and the ruddy cliffs have a colder hue than flushed his cheek when he married me we passed the porch where the swallows breed we left the little brown church behind and i leaned on his arm though i had no need only to feel him so strong and kind one thing i never can quite forget it grips my throat when i try to pray the keen salt smell of a drying net that hung on the churchyard wall that day he would have taken a long long grave a long long grave where he stood so tall oh god the crash of the breaking wave and the smell of the nets on the churchyard wall the bellman amelia josephine burr end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Gift of God by Edwin Arlington Robinson Read for LibriVox.org by Alumina Blessed with the joy that only she of all alive shall ever know, she wears a proud humility for what it was the will did fill, that her degree should be so great among the favored of the Lord, that she may scarcely bear the weight of her bewildering reward. As one apart immune alone, or featured for the shining ones, and like to none that she has known, of other women's other sons. The firm fruition of her need, he shines anointed and he blurs, her vision till it seems indeed a scarlage to call him hers. She fears a little for so much of what is best and hardly dares to think of him as one to touch with aches, indignities, and cares. She sees him rather at the goal, still shining and her dream foretells, the proper shining of a soul where nothing ordinary dwells. Perchance a canvas of the town would find him far from flags and shouts, and leave him only the renown of many smiles and many doubts. Perchance the crude and common tongue would have up strangely with his worth, but she, with innocence unstung, would read his name around the earth. And others, knowing how this youth would shine if love could make him great, when caught and tortured for the truth, would only write and hesitate, while she, arranging for his days what centuries could not fulfill, transmute him with her faith and praise and has him shining where she will she crowns him with her gratefulness and says again that life is good and should the gift of god be less in him than in her motherhood his fame though vague will not be small as upward through her dreams he fears half clouded with the crimson fall of roses thrown on marble stairs scribner's edwin arlington robinson end of poem this recording is in the public domain Young Eden by Witter Benner, read for LibriVox.org by Novacom's VO, on January 8, 2023. Flushed from a fairy flagon, my country love and I, sat by a bush forgetting, old conscience and his fretting, just dreaming there and letting trouble trundle by, like a dragon dead on a wagon, drawn against the sky. Foldy roll de ralio trouble in the sky. She knew it was only a cloud I saw when I pointed out a dangling claw. But she let me say my say for the day. Red ripe was a pretty day, and she thought my way was a city way. And oh, I liked her thinking, while each unhindered curl glinted in the sunlight, hinted of its yellow, that I who spoke to such a girl was something of a fellow. Foldy roll de ralio, was she really thinking so? There's the tree, I gaily told her, apples, apples at our feet. Come before we're one day older, we shall gather, we shall eat. Now's the time for apple hunger, not if we were one day younger. 
younger, older, shyer, bolder, would an apple taste so sweet? Full de roll de ralio, apples at our feet. Bewildered, she was with me on the run, toward the tree that held its treasure to the sun. This, of all the trees of treasure, was the one, condemning leisure and inviting lovely pleasure. She was with me, she was by me on the run, with a cheek that turned its treasure to the sun. Full de roll de ralio, ralio we gaily go. Full, why should she stop and never speak? Why should the color in her cheek change, not glowing gay and meek? Deeper, redder than I knew, she was mistress of a hue, though demurely, richly, surely, rising in her cheek. Full de roll de ralio, the change in her cheek. There was before us, on the ground, eyes upon us, not a sound. Sat a neighbor's truant child of seven years. Her lap was full of sunny gold, but her eyes in the sun, her eyes were old, were sober, seeming laden, and such a little maiden, unawares but laden with some dead woman's tears. Full de roll de ralio, a child of seven years. Some woman who had watched and wept, but had not any speech, watched and wept now within that little breast, caught and caressed those little hands and would have kept beyond their reach. The anguish in that orchard, the apple bough unblessed, the brightness that had tortured, the heart within the breast. And we beheld, and see it even now, a bent and withered apple bough, of beauty dispossessed, which bore its poison long ago. Oh, why we pluck it still, we may not know, but only that it leaves no rest to the heart within the breast. Full de roll de ralio, this heart within the breast. Abashed and parting on our ways, we saw that woman's poor dead hand, ghostly making its demand. Fall pitiful and sad, we saw the child, forgetful of our gaze, laughing like any child that plays and laughs in any land. Lean and touch a toy she had, half hidden in her hand. We saw her pat and poise and raise, an apple in her hand. Full de roll de rally o, oh, the apple in her hand. Young Eden, published by Yale Review, written by Witter Binner. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Romance by Comrade Aiken. Read for LibriVox.org by Jonathan Jones. The last farewells were said. Friends hurried ashore. The screw threshed foam and jarred, and the pier slid by. Hands went to ears to still the siren's roar. Handkerchiefs waved, and there was a call and cry. Over it all, austere and pure and high, glittering snow and gold, the towers looked down, serene and cold, regardless of the town. The wind blew north, and gravely on it came the trolling of the metropolitan bells. First the four chimes, softly as puffs of flame, then the deep five, slow, gentle, gleaming swells, came glancing in the sun with ocean smells, up from the harbour and the further sea, over the stern poised white gulls, Italy. Over the stern they poised and dipped and glanced, now dull in shade, now shining in bright sun. And one youth watched them as they whirled and danced, and noticed how they circled one by one. To have those wings, that freedom God, what fun! And watching them he felt youth in him strong, Wings in his blood, and in his heart a song. Autumn. Already now the keen wind nipped, The skies arched cold bright blue, And the leaves were turning. Whitely over the waves the cold squalls whipped, Scarlet and pale, the maple trees were burning, Tossing in gusts and whirling and returning, on Staten Island, wonderfully afar, In Bacchic sun they flamed with mad desire. Autumn, 
bringing to old adventures death. Sadness at all things past, things passing still, touching all earth with strange and mystic breath, veiling all earth in fire ere winter kill. Even this youth felt now his deep heart fill with a great tide of mystery and sadness, poignant sorrow for all past hours of gladness. Those times, would others come as keen as they? Was life to come as living as life past? Ah, he was youth. Life could not say him nay. The blood sang swift in him. Doubt could not last. Let all life dead beneath his feet be cast, and he would trample it, divinely singing. Life lay before, more rapturous music ringing. More lusts, more shining eyes, more dizzy laughter. More madder music, flute and violin. With drums before and roses showered after. Always in new bliss drowning his old sin. Sin? Was it that? And straight in merry din of song and shout and laugh, this thought was lost. It was no sin to live, whate'er the cost. High overhead, the Brooklyn bridges passed, span upon span, and rumorous with cars, their shadows on the deck a moment cast, with dizzy thunder from their traffic's wars. Those grey stone piers, would soon be crowned with stars. Even now their brows were soft with waning sun. The homeward march of armies was begun. Goodbye, old bridges, and New York, goodbye. Northward the engines took him, now no more. His gaze hung here, he watched the western sky, blazing with vision's isles and fairy shore. Northward the vibrant ship beneath him bore, the sound spread out before them, wide and blue, clean came the wind, whereon the seagulls flew. Soft fields, the flaming trees at twilight farm, New York was gone, he drew deep breaths of air, keen as far it was, then slow and calm. He turned to walk, when, lo, a girl came there, deep sunset in her eyes and on her hair, a white dress clinging to her knees, one hand, rising to shade her blue eyes as she scanned. The swiftly gliding shore, the passing ships, the bellboys bobbing and tolling in the tide. A moment, breath hung lifeless on his lips, his heart froze quiet, no one was at her side. Faintly he smiled, he thought her eyes replied, remote lights meeting in them, quickening. He passed, and all his body seemed to sing. He passed, then turned, and as he turned, she turned. Her eyes met his eyes shyly, then again, she looked away, and all her soft face burned, and all her virgin heart was big with pain. From the saloon below came soft a strain of some new ragtime, bidding feet to move, imploring hands to cling, young hearts to love. Sweetly it came, seductive, soft, bizarre, huddled and breathless now, now note by note crying its separate pain, now near, now far, mingled with all the throbbing of the boat. How beautiful the first star came to float, impalpable in dusk, low in the east. It seemed to sing on when the music ceased. Herald of love, lo, love itself it seemed, singing, into the twilight of her soul. How beautiful! 
Across dark waters gleamed red lights and green. She heard a bellboy toll, suddenly caught in the after washes roll. A smell of autumn flowers came down the wind, beauty so keen, it seemed it must have sinned. What was this night? What did it bring to her? What flower unfolded in its darkness now? She was this night. She felt her deep soul stir, the slow, strange stir of blossoms in the bough. How beautiful! She watched the four-foot plough shear through the ferning black, the white waves gliding, dizzily past, now swelling, now subsiding. O oh, youth, O oh, music, O oh, sweet wizardry, of young life sung like fire through beating veins. O oh, covering darkness and persuasive sea, O oh, night of stars, of blisses and of pains. But most, O oh, youth, that but an hour remains. Be fierce, be sweet with us before you go. For, knowing you, the best of life we know. Enchanted so, she watched dark waters slipping, swiftly and dizzily past the sheer black side. Watched the fierce wind in sudden flurries whipping, the torn spray from the waves against the tide. High among the stars she saw the masthead glide. Steadily now, now swinging slowly, slightly, there the high masthead lantern burning brightly. O oh, youth, O oh, music, O oh, sweet wizardry, O oh, covering darkness of mysterious night, she turned, and on the dark deck, quietly, he came again, an open door shed light, strongly across him for a space, then fright suddenly set her wild heart beating, beating, suddenly set her endlessly repeating. I mustn't speak, I mustn't speak, and then he stood beside her, close and warm and strong, and she knew sudden the beauty that's in men, and all her blood few musical with song. Beautiful, isn't it? Have you known it long? Calmly he looked at her, and gently spoke. She nodded lightly, then the warm words broke. Easily, quickly, fervently from her heart, all the restraint of all her youth was gone. She felt a thousand warm new instincts start out of her soul, birds taking wing with dawn, singing their hearts out with a deep breath drawn. Yes, I've known it for years and loved it too. Beautiful, this, is this the first for you? They talked in low tones, and the sound of the sea falling of foam and swish of dropping spray encircled them with song incessantly. They felt alone. The world seemed far away. They too, they too, so seemed the night to say, a darkness and a stealing fragrance came, spreading through all their souls, silent as flame. O oh, beauty of being a living thing, she thought, of drawing breath beneath these stars, this sky. O oh, beautiful fire that from his eyes she caught, and made her breath rise quick, her lips burn dry. What was this thing? Dread came, she scarce knew why. Impulsively she went, yet she had given her word to dine with him. Her earth was heaven. He watched her go and smiled, her white dress blowing softly in dark, so young, so sweet, so brave. She was so pure, by God there was no knowing. 
and yet half a mind still to behave. No, though, far better take what fortune gave. Dance to the music that was played for him. Smiling, he mused of her. His eyes grow dim. And he could feel her warmness by his side. And all his body flushed with sweet desire to take her shining loveliness for bride, to kiss, to fuse with her in single fire. O oh, youth, O oh, young heart, musical as a lyre, O oh, covering darkness of mysterious night. He knew these things, his heart was filled with light. What was one more? What was one more? Ah, how he scorned this qualm, innocent, such girls seem but never are. No, he was not her first, and cold and calm, he turned and sought the brightly lighted bar. The music rose through shut doors faint and far, wailful, down in her stateroom mirror there. A young girl eyed herself with frightened stare. She eyed herself with quick breath, frightened stare. The fingers of one hand caught at her throat, and half-consciously she smoothed her hair. The music called to her, bizarre, remote. On a vast hurrying tide she seemed afloat, hurrying through a darkness downward ever, starless along some subterranean river. Where was she going? Where was the current taking? Vaguely she knew that it would lead to pain, to a dark, endless pain, her deep heart breaking, to a grey world forever dulled with rain. And yet she knew this would not come again. And all the sweet bliss came imploring, pleading, melting her soul, bruising her heart to bleeding. O oh God, she did not know. Yet future sorrow seemed somehow paid for by this instant bliss. A brief today was worth a long tomorrow. O oh youth, O oh night, this joy she dared not miss. Her whole soul yearned for this young lover's kiss, though it be paid for through eternity. O oh, had not God designed this thing to be? Was not her mouth for this young mouth intended, since all her living body told her so? Was it not preordained that so be ended, a girlhood colder than December snow? A starlight kiss, she need no further go, his warm hands touching hers, or was this sin, just this? She shut her eyes to fires within. To those fierce central fires she closed her eyes, yet dimly of their passion was aware, and felt their flames like drunkenness arise, whirling her soul, making life strangely fair. She eyed herself with held breath, frightened stare. Alas, was it the alchemy of sin? that made her lovelier far than e'er she'd been. Plausibly sweet, the music came to her, through many doors most plausible and sweet, setting some subtle pulse in her astir, smoothing in song her heart's erratic beat. Dizziness came, unstrung her knees, her feet, and she sank down a space upon her bed, shutting her eyes, mad reelings in her head. How would this end? And would her whole life change, swayed by this mastering sun as sways the moon? Would all her way of life be new and strange? Her friends be lost, her kin desert her soon? Passion surged up in her, and in its swoon these doubts were swept aside, obscure and fleeting, Somewhere she heard a beating, beating, beating. Was it her heart 
the loud pulse in her ear, or music some recurring undertone. The drums, perhaps, she raised her head to hear. The beating ceased, only the tireless drone of toiling engines and the sea's hushed moan, soft through the fast-shut port, and that was all. Steps passed and repassed down the muffled hall. Steps passed and repassed on the deck above, ringing like iron. The curtains by her bed quivered forever to the engine's move, and from the lamp a quivering light was shed. These senseless things, when all her life was dead, would still go on, steps pass, the curtains quiver. These things are others. They would last forever. Quickly she rose, and in the mirror's shine, looked at herself a quiet moment's space. It was as if the earth's autumnal wine had touched her soul, her body had a grace that passing life has, and lovely was her face, with a strange loveliness, and in her eyes was the deep glory of October skies. She was alive, her blood flew warm and young, no more than this she knew that she was fair, and happiness through her deep heart was sung, passionate joy as light as flame in air. O youth, O love, oblivious of all care, O lithe, swift-blooded youth, O rose of earth, O warm-eyed loveliness of fragrant mirth. Giddy, with whirling thought, she left her room, and down the corridor with fainting feet, lightly she went, caught onward to sweet doom, and only heard her heart's loud, tremulous beat. Through opening doors, most plausible, most sweet, the music rose to her, and he stood there, smiling in all that noise and whir and glare. Over the shining silver sparkling glass, the smooth white tablecloth he leaned and smiled. The whole world vanished. They were lad and lass. In love and face to face, hearts running wild. Deep in her eyes he looked. Oh, what a child! Her soft breast rose and fell. Her throat's pure white beat little pulse of joy and fright. No need to talk, for in their eyes they met, treading an air so soft, so light, so fine, that they were speechless, words they could forget. They only smiled and shyly sipped their wine, and smiled again and felt their full heart shine, talked breathlessly a little, and longed to lean nearer, more near, till no moat lay between. Not light or darkness, word or heaven or star, not wind, nor warm, nor cold, but just they two, meeting at last, two spirits come from far, Face raised to face, white flowers made sweet with dew, shining and passionate and young and new, the two warm bodies singing each to each, mingling at last in love's harmonious speech. The lights, the noise, the tumult passed away, as in a dream without a sound they passed. She only knew that it was wildly gay, and shy and bliss unbearable. At last, under the high, dark, starward gliding mast, in grateful night they sat, he brought her coat, and trembling wrapped the scarf around her throat, letting his fingers linger there a space, longer than there was need, so sweet she smiled. So close they were to that soft, wistful face. The stars looked down upon them, clear and mild. Woman and maiden, girl and little child. She was all these. A moment 
he was shaken, lest he do wrong, lest he might prove mistaken. Only a moment. Passion rose again. Quiet, he took her hand and held it long. And all her virgin heart grew big with pain, and all her newborn body ached with song. Blindly she prayed to God to make her strong, more blindly cried to earth to make her weak, and looked at him near tears and could not speak. He was a loveliness she could not bear, like a fierce furnace seemed his beauty now. A fire that caught her throat, her lips, her hair, her parching eyes, her pained and beating brow. Only to give herself, she cared not how, into the flame, body and soul to fling, to have him hurt her, ah, divinest thing. Four bells were struck, twas ten o'clock, he said, and still the sea rushed past under the night. The engines toiled and the great steamer sped, and they could see the bow wash dimly white. Fall into darkness the masthead light quivered among the stars, and in its fire a span of forestay shone like golden wire. Little by little they were left alone. The decks were emptied only from the bar, Game shouts and laughter, and a drunkard's groan, the glasses clinking and a strummed guitar. The door shut, and the sounds grew faint and far, and all the deck was dark, only the sea lifted its great voice like infinity. O oh, youth, O oh, music, O oh, sweet wizardry, of young love sung like fire through beating veins. O oh, covering darkness and persuasive sea, O oh, night of stars, of blisses and of pains. But most, O oh, youth, that but an hour remains, be fierce, be sweet with us before you go, for knowing you the best of life we know. Beneath his kiss, her mouth, rose soft and warm, and dewy soft as rose leaves were her eyes. Under his hands, shaken as with a storm, he felt her soft breast fall and shudder and rise, torn with impassioned breath, unuttered cries, quivering, straining breast against his breast. She clung to him, her mouth on his mouth, Pressed, and only knew that this was life at last, forgot all else in agony of bliss. Into this fire of love all earth was cast, the stars, the sea were mingled in this kiss, and through her heart the blood with sing and hiss poured a red madness, surged a riotous pain, unbearable music cried out in her brain. O oh, love, he said, O oh, let me come with you. I love you so this night, O oh, let me come. Our God had pity, she knew not what to do, but sat all quiet, frozen, shrinking, dumb, and only heard the toiling engines hum, the rush of sea, the swish of dropping spray, her clamorous heart, and all that she could say was a quick yes, and then a broken breath that quivered like a sob, and then she rose, dizzy and weak and pale, like one near death, and now her heart was fire, and now it froze. Faint in her room she stood, the door to close. She might still turn the key, she cried a space, Long in the glass stared at her pallid face, And heard a step tramp over the deck above, Ringing like iron. The curtains by her bed quivered forever To the engine's move, And from the lamp a quivering light was shed. These things would all go on when she was dead, 
Trembling with misty eyes, she loosed the pin under her throat, and mad fires whirled up within. Mad fires whirled up, engulfing all her soul, beyond the sun and stars across all space, power that earth nor heaven could now control. She heard her lover come with quickening pace. Nowhere to hide, alas, his shining face, Though she hid under seas, would find her there, Though she hid under mountains, lay her bare. Across the stars, nearer, more near it came, And now earth shook with it, and now the sea, And her white body, tremulous with shame, From its sheer anguish knew that it was he, Yearned for this wonder that was soon to be, and all her heart made music for his feet, and all the world re-echoed to their beat. Marriage of youth, and a quick darkness fell, and time and space went down, consumed in fire. Through that dark space, only one breath to tell that here was youth and love and wild desire. One heart that to itself sang ever higher, Tremulous, passionate, despite all pain. How wonderful, how wonderful, again. October earth with scarlet maple leaf, With oak leaves brown, with flaming leaves and pale, Mysterious autumn, symbol of all grief. Symbols of life that die and hopes that fail. Now on the threshing floor has fallen the flail. The hands are elsewhere that have stored the grain. Now comes a season of snows and bitter rain. Weeks passed, and then one day there came a note. To New York for this youth, he tore and read. It was that girl he played with on the boat, scarcely three shaky lines, in which she said that she was sick with typhoid, nearly dead, wanted to say she loved him, then she cried, Oh God, if he would come before she died. Loved him, and blackness fell, and in his eyes so long unused, and even now ashamed. He felt the warm tears quickening to rise. Loved him? He had not known. Could he be blamed? Then a great light of sorrow in him flamed, and bitterness, his sight swam quickly dim, thinking how little it had meant to him. Scarce knowing why, he packed his things and went. He was surprised on seeing her, to find how lovely she had been, though pale and spent. He sat beside her, striving to be kind, stroking her forehead, yet she had divined, and known too bitterly, before she died, this man had never loved her, but had lied. And he knew this, and he knew that she had known. In her dark eyes he saw the mastered yearning, or the unspoken love that died in moan, shrunk on itself through all her body burning. And many days the memory came returning, of her last kiss, quivering wet with tears, her clinging hands, her brimmed eyes, dark with fears, until at times a sudden terror came, lest through great pity he should love one dead, and so burning sweet recurred in him this shame, so haunted him those eyes, that fallen head, the lips that pleaded so, the words she said, pathetic words, 
These haunted him a space. And then, in the dark of time, he lost her face. O oh, autumn, bringing to old adventures death, sadness at all things past, things passing still. You touched this love with strange and dreadful breath. Easy as leaf is human love to chill. Easy as leaf is human to kill. Yet beautiful is that death with sudden flame. Ere it goes down to darkness, whence it came. The Poetry Journal. Conrad Aiken. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pilgrimage by Laura Campbell Read by Jonathan Jones I will tread on the golden grass of my bright field When the passion star has paled, when the night has fled I will tread on the golden grass of my bright field In the glow of the early day, when the east is red In my bright field a broken beech tree leans and a giant boulder stands by a black burn wood, and a rough built falling wall and a rotting door, sear like a scar the spot where a house once stood. My eyes are mute on the white edge of the dawn, my feet fall swift and bare upon the way. The long, soft hills grow black against the sky, the great wood moves, unfolds, the high trees sway. The worn road stretches thin, and the low hedge stirs, and a strong old bridge looms frail o'er a ghostly stream, and a white flower turns and breathes and turns again. Does it live as I live? Does it wake as I waked from a dream? How merciless is the dawn! How poignant the hush in my soul! How changeless the changing sky! How fearful that wild bird's call! I hear the quick suck of his wing, the push of his breast. He is gone. How swift is the neon of time! How endless, beginningless all! I tread on the golden grass of my bright field. The sun's on a hundred hills, the night has fled. I tread on the golden grass of my bright field, in the glow of the early day, and the east is red. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Vain Excuse by Walter Conrad Arnesberg Read for LibriVox.org by Deanna Lee Be patient, life, when love is at the gate, and when he enters, let him be at home. Think of the roads that he has had to roam. Think of the years that he has had to wait. But if I let love in, I shall be late. Another has come first. There is no room. And I am busy at the thoughtful loom. Let love be patient, the importunate. O oh, life, be idle, and let love come in, and give thy dreamy hair that love may spin. But love himself is idle with his song. Let love come last, and then may love last long. Be patient, life, for love is not the last. Be patient now with death, for love has passed. The Trend Walter Conrad Arnesberg End of poem This recording is in the public domain. Sonnet 30 by Arthur Davison Fick Read for LibriVox.org by Jessica Castro Rappel You mean, my friend, you do not greatly care for these harsh portraits I have lately done? 
You like my old style better, like the rare enameled softness of that princess one. True, this old woman with the sunken throat, painted like cordage, is not sweet to view. Perhaps the blear whites of her eyes connote no element of loveliness to you. Ah yes, we all must love the sapphire lake, the rainbow and the rose, but these alone? Or is there some slight wonder where pines shake on bare-ribbed mountain peaks of shattered stone? So these disturb? I fear this is the end of days when I shall please your taste, my friend. The Forum, Arthur Davison Fick End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lost Treasure by Lydia Gibson, read for LibriVox.org, by Alumina. You know deep in your heart, it could not last, and, when a wind, newborn on some hillside, some fair tall hill the other side of Crete, came laden with the dear odorous past, laden with scents of gardens that have died, buried in dust, not any longer sweet, then, realized, all the unlovely years lay on your heart, like those old gardens dust, you had forgotten how your life was fair, for all the memories were dulled with tears, sin shed, and unexpected moth and rust, ate deep, and not remembered was but care. So is your treasure lost, vanished away, nothing but wind and half-shut eyes and grass, nothing of now but strivings after then, and not heard in the clear air of today, but dusty wings that crumble as they pass, you have not strength to make them live again. The Masses, Lydia Gibson. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Old Faring Down, Hampshire, England. Read for LibriVox.org by Hope. Soft as a treader on mosses, I go through the village that sleeps, the village too early abed. For the night still shuffles a gypsy in the woods of the east, and the west remembers the sun. Not all are asleep. There are faces that lean from the walls of the garden. Look sharply, or you will not see them, or think them another stone in the wall. I spoke to a stone, and it answered like an aged rock that crumbles. Each falling piece was a word. Five have I buried, it said, and seven are over the sea. Here is a hut that I pass, so lowly it has no brow. And dwarfs sit within at a table, a boy waits apart by the hearth. On his face is the patience of firelight, but his eyes seek the door in a far world. It is not the call to the table he waits, but the call of the sea-rimmed forests. And cities that stir in a dream, I haste by the low-browed door. Least my arms go in and betray me, a mother jealously passing. He will go, the pale dwarf, and walk tall among giants. The child with his eyes on the far land, and fame like a young curled leaf in his heart. The stream that darts from the hanging hill, like a silver wing that must sing as it flies, is folded and still on the breast of the village that sleeps. Each mute old house is more old than the other, and each wears its vines like ragged hair round the half-blind windows. If a child should laugh, if a girl should sing, would the house rub the vines from their eyes and listen and live? A voice comes now from a cottage, a voice that is young and must sing, a honeyed stab on the air, and the houses do not wake. I look through the leaf-bloused window and start as a gazer who, passing a death vault, sees life sitting hopeful within. She is young, but a woman, round-breasted, waiting the peril of Eve, and she makes the shadows about her sweet, as the glooms that play in a pine wood. She sits at a harpsichord, old as the walls are, and longing flows in the trickling fairy notes, like a hidden brook in a forest, seeking and seeking the sun. I have watched a young tree on the edge of a wood, when the mist is weaving and drifting. Slowly the boughs disappear, and the leaves reach out, like the drowning hands of children, till the gray blur quivers cold, where the green grace drank of the sun, so now as I gaze the moros, creep weaving and winding their mist round the beauty of her who sings, 
They hide the soft rings of her hair, dear as a child's curling fingers. They shut out the trembling sun of eyes that are deep as a bending mother's, and her bridal body is scarfed with their chill. For old and old is the story. Over and over I hear it. Over and over I listen to murmurs that are always the same in these towns that sleep, where, gray and unwed, a woman passes. Her cramped, drab gown the bounds of a world she holds with grief and silence, and a gossip whose tongue alone is unwithered mumbles the tale by her affabled gait. How the lad must go, and the girl must stay, singing alone to the years in a dream. Then a letter, a rumor, a word, from the land that reaches for lovers, and gives them not back, and the maiden looks up with a face that is old, her smile as her body is ever more barren, her cheek like the bark of the beech tree, where climbs the gray winter. Now have I seen her young, the lone girl singing, with the full round breast and the berry lip, and heart that runs to a dawn rise on new world mountains. The weeping ash in the dooryard gathers the song in its boughs, and the gown of dawn she will never wear. I can listen no more. Goodbye, little town, old fairing down. I climb the long, dark hillside, but the ache I have found here I cannot outclimb. Oh, heart, if we had not heard, if we did not know, there is that in the village that never will sleep. Hampshire, England. Scribner's Olive Tilford Dargan. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In the Roman Forum by Amelia Josephine Burr. Read for LibriVox.org by Deanna Lee. Nothing but beauty now. No longer at the point of goading fear, the sullen tributary world comes near, before all subjugating Rome to bow. No more the pavement of the forum rings, to breathless victory's exultant tread, before the heavy march of captive kings. Here stood the royal dead in sculptured immortality, their gaze remote above the turmoil of the street, hoarse with its living struggle at their feet. Here spoke the law, that voice of bronze was heard by all the world, and stirred the latent mind of nations in the bud, bright with the laurels, bitter with the blood. Of heroes upon heroes was this place, where the strong heart of an imperial race beat with the essence of a man's life. Princes and people evermore at strife, in sense and worship, clash of armored rage, ambition soaring up the sky like flame, interminable war that mortals wage from century to century the same. Still, fortune holds the crown for those who dare. Mankind and many a distant other wear leaps panting toward the promise of her face. But here, no more of coveting nor care. No longer here the weltering humid tide sluices the marketplace and scatters wide the weakest foam to perish where they list. Now, by the sovereign silence purified, spring showers all with fragrant amethyst. Were once these pulses violent and swift as those that shake the cities of today? How indolently sweet the petals drift from yonder nodding spray. Warming their broidered raiment in the sun, the little bright-eyed lizards bask and run, or fallen temples gracious in decay. Man's arrogance with calculated art boasted in marble, now the quiet heart of the great mother dreams eternal things in brief bright roses and ethereal green or more exuberant sings, in poppies poured profusely to the air from secret hordes of scarlet. Nothing seen but swoons with beauty, beauty everywhere. Nothing but beauty now. Here is the immortality of Rome. Not where the city rises, dome on dome, seek we the living soul of ancient might, but in this temple of green silence, here, flame purer than the vestal is alight. 
the world again draws near in reverence. But now it comes to pay the tribute of a nobler coin than fear. In wondering worship, not in fierce dismay, men bow the knee to what of Rome remains. Time's long lustration has effaced her stains. All that is perishable now is past, and earth her portion tenderly transmutes to evanescent beauty of her own. Jubilant flowers and nectar-breathing fruits, living in deathless glory at the last, divinity alone. The Bellman, Amelia Josephine Burr End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ash Wednesday by John Erskine Read for LibriVox.org by Jonathan Jones After hearing a lecture on the origins of religion Here in the lonely chapel I will wait Here will I rest, if any rest may be So fair the day is and the hours so late I shall have few to share the blessed calm with me Calm and soft light, sweet inarticulate calls, One shallow dish of airy golden fire By molten chains above the altar swinging, Draws my eyes up from the shadowed stalls To the warm chancel dome, Crag-like the clustered organs loom, Yet from their thunder-threatening choir Flows but a ghostly singing, Half-human voices reaching home in infinite, tremulous surge and falls. Light on his stops and keys, and pallor on the player's face, who, listening rapt with finger skill to seize the pattern of a mood's elusive grace, captures his spirit in an airy lace of fading, fading harmonies. Oh, let your corners soothe my weariness, frail music, where you keep tryst with the even fall, Where turn by turn you find a pathway smooth To yonder gleaming cross, Or nearer creep along the bronzed wall, Where shade by shade through deeps of brown Comes the still twilight down. Wilt thou not rest, my thought? Wouldst thou go back to that pain-breeding room, Whence only by strong wrenchings thou wast brought. O oh, weary, weary questionings, Will ye pursue me to the altar rail Where my old faith for century clings? And back again my heart, reluctant hail yonder, Where crushed against the cheerless wall tiptoe I glimpse the tear on tear of faces Unserene and startled eyes. Such eyes as on grim surgeon work are set, on desperate outmanoeuvrings of doom? Still must I hear the boding voice with cautious rise and fall, tracking relentless to its lair each fever-bred progenitor of faith, each fugitive ancestral fear? Still must I follow as the wraith of antique awe toward a wreck-making beach Drives derelict. Nay, rest, rest, my thought, Where long love sound and shadow teach Quietness to conscience overwrought. Hearken, the choristers, the white-robed priest, Move through the chapel dim, Sounding of warfare and the victor's palm, Of valiant marchings, of the feast Spread for the pilgrim in a havened calm. And on the first lips of my steadfast race Sounded that battle hymn, Quaint, heaven vauntings with God's gauntlet flung, To me bequeathed from age to age My challenge and my heritage. The Lord is in his holy place, How in their ears the herald voice has rung. Now will I make bright their sword, will pilgrim in their ancient path, will haunt the temple of their Lord. Truth that is neither variable nor hath shadow of turning, 
I will find in the wise plottings of their faithful mind, a finding not, as in this frustrate hour by question hounded, waylaid by despair, yet in these uses shall I know his power, as the warm flesh by breathing knows the air. O oh, futile comfort! My faith, hungry heart, still in your sweetness tastes a poisonous sour. Far off, far off I quiver neath the smart of old indignities and obscure scorn, indelibly on man's proud spirit laid, that now, in time's ironic masquerade, minister healing to the hurt and worn. What are those streams that from the altar pour where goat and ox and human captive bled to feed the blood lust of the murderous priest? I cannot see where Christ's dear love is shed. So deep the insatiate horrors washes red, flesh stains and frenzy sears and gore. Beneath that cross, whereon his hands outspread, what forest shades behold, what shameful rites, Of maidenhood surrendered to the beast, In obscene worship on midsummer night. What imperturbable disguise Enwraps these organs with a chaste restraint, To chant innocuous hymns and litanies, For sinner and adoring saint, Which yet inherit like an old blood taint, some naked caperings in the godliest tune, Goat songs and jest strong with a breath of pan, That charmed the easy cowgirl and her man, In uncouth tryst beneath a scandalous moon. Oh, could I hearken with their trust, Or see with their pure seeing eyes, Who of the frame of these dear mysteries Were not too wise. Why cannot I, as in a stronger hour, Outface the horror that defeats me now? Here I not reaped complacent the rich power That harvests from this praise and bowing low? On this strong music have I mounted up, That yonder rail broke bread and shared the holy cup, And on that cross have hung and felt God's pain, Sorrowing, sorrowing, till the world's hall's end. Not from these forms my questionings come, The serving truth are purified, But from the truth itself, the way, the goal, One challenge vast that strikes faith dumb. If truth be fickle, who shall be our guide? Truth that is neither variable, nor hath shadow of turning, Ah, where turns she not? Where yesterday she stood, now the horizon empties low her steps, Where yonder scholar woos are hardly culled. Yet shall he find her never, but the thought mantling within him like her blood, Shall from his eloquence fade, and leave his words flavoured with Vacant quaintness for his son. What crafty patience, scholar, hast thou used, Useless ere it was begun? What headless waste of wing, Beating vainly round and round? If no one babble where the tongues confused, But they who handle truth from sound to sound, Master another speech continuously, Deaf to familiar words, our callous ear will quiver to the edge of utterance strange. When truth to God's truth, weary sight draws near, cannot God see her till she suffer change? Must ye then change, my vanished youth, home customs of my dreams? Change and farewell. Farewell, you lost phantasmic truth that will not constant dwell, but flees the passion of our eyes, and leaves no hint behind her when she dawns or whither dies, or if she live at all, or only for a moment seems. Here, though, 
I only dream I find her. Here will I watch till the twilight darken. Yonder a scholar's voice spins on, mesh upon mesh of loveless fate. Here will I rest while truth deserts him still. What hath she left thee, brother, but thy voice? After her, have they will and happy be thy choice? Here rather will I rest and hearken. Voices longer dead, but longer loved than thine. Yet still my most of peace is more unrest. As one who plods a summer road feels the coolness of his own motion stirs, but when he stops, the dead heat smothers him. Here in this calm my soul is weariest, each question with malicious goad pressing the choice that still my soul defers to visioned hours not thus eclipsed and dim, lest in my haste I deem the truth's invariable part is her alluding of man's heart. Thou well calm priest, who paces slow after the stalwart marching choir, have men through thee taught God their dear desire? Hath God through thee absolved sin? What is thy benediction if I go, sore plexed and wrought within? Open the chapel doors, and let boisterous music play us out toward the flaring molten west, whither the nerve-racked day is set. Let the loud world, flooding back, gulf us in his hungry rout. Rest, what part have we in rest? Boy with a happy face and hurrying feet, who with thy friendly caps salute sendest bright hail across the college street. If thou could see my answering lips how mute, how loath to take thy student courtesy. What truth have I for thee? Rather thy wisdom, lad, impart. Share thy gift of strength with me, Still with the past I wrestle, but the future girds thy heart. Clutter of shriveled yesterdays that clothe us like a shell. Thy spirit sloughs their bondage off to walk newborn and free. All things the human heart hath learned, God, heaven, earth, and hell, thou weighest not for what they were, but what they still may be whether the scholar delve and mine from faith wreck buried deep or the priest his rules and holy rites letters and spirit keep toil or trust in breathless dust they shall starve at last for truth scholar and priest shall live from thee who art eternal youth holier if thou dost tread it every path the prophets trod Clearer where thou dost worship, rise the ancient hymns to God. Not by the priests, but by thy prayers are altars sanctified. Strong with new love, where thou dost kneel, the cross whereon Christ died. The Yale Review, John Erskine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Laggard Song by Richard Le Gallienne Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk I had no heart to write to thee in prose The sadness in me sore demanded song But the song came not Laggard as the birds that will not sing us back the little leaves O oh, winter of my heart, when comes the spring? I am sore weary of these death-like days, This shroud unheaving of eternal snow. O oh, winter of my heart, when comes the spring? Tis time to answer, O oh, nightingale, 
tis thine to sing the winter all away release the world from bondage and bring back the sound of many waters and of trees and little sleeping lives anumb with cold yea all the resurrection of the world o winter of my heart o nightingale harper's richard le gallienne end of poem this recording is in the public domain Grotesque by Ruth Guthrie Harding. Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee. With the first light on the skyline came the rapping of the sickles, and the brown arms of the reapers bent to toil another morn. Close beside me in the glimmer, in the golden sweep and shimmer, knelt a reaper strange among us crooning through the ragged corn born of sorrow gone to morrow gone to lie in yonder valley where their fathers long have lain men who know not ship nor sabre each but drudges by his neighbour and the fields wherein they labour are a heritage of pain sleep was heavy on our eyelids when a lone star followed sunset but we missed the pale young stranger none knew whither he had gone then from where the dead are lying with the night wind's tender sighing rose and fell a last low cadence of the voice we heard at dawn weary reapers early sleepers brief the glow that drifts across them from the waning august moon those that rest beyond its gleaming lie unvexed of drift or dreaming and the fields with harvest teeming have forgot them all too soon and of poem this recording is in the public domain ballad of a dead lady by richard le gallienne read for librivox dot org by deanna lee all old fair things are in their places i count them over and miss but one the april flowers are running races the green world stretches its arms to the sun the nuptial dance of the days is begun the same young stars and the same old skies and all that was lost again is won but where have they hidden those great eyes all have come back dogwood and daisies all things ripple and riot and run swallow and swallow in airy mazes a fairy frolic of fire and fun the same old enchanted web is spun with diamond dews for the same old flies yet all is new spite of solomon but where have they hidden those great eyes lovely as love are the newborn faces god knows they are fair to look upon and my heart goes out to the young embraces to the flight of the young to the young but time what is it thou hast done for my heart mid all the blossom cries roses are many the rose is gone ah where have they hidden those great eyes envoy prince I bring you my April praises, but oh, on my heart a shadow lies, for a face I see not at all my gaze is. Ah, where have they hidden those great eyes? Puck, Richard Le Gallienne. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An Epitaph by Walter Conrad Ahrensberg Read for LibriVox.org by Derek Atwater Perhaps it doesn't matter that you died. Life is a boundless hue which you saw through. You never told on life. You had your pride. 
but life has told on you. The Trend Walter Conrad Ahrensberg End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. War by Witter Biner Read for LibriVox.org by Derek Atwater Fools, 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 your blood is hot today. It cools when you are clay. It joins the very clod wherein you look at God, wherein at last you see the living God, the loving God, which was your enemy. The Nation, Witter Biner. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. France by Percy McKay. Read for LibriVox.org by Nidhi Prakash. Half artist and half anchorite, part siren and part Socrates, her face alluring fair and yet recondite, smiled through her salons and academies. Lightly she wore her double mask, till sudden at war's kindling spark, her inmost self in shining mail and cask blazed to the world her single soul, John the Ark. The Nation, Percy McKay. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Drum by E. Sutton. Read for LibriVox.org by Jonathan Jones. There's a rhythm down the road where the elms overarch of the drum of the drum. There's a glint through the gleam, there's a column on the march. Here they come, here they come, to the flat resounding clank. They are tramping rank on rank, and the bayonet flashes ripple from the flank to the flank. I am rhythm marching rhythm, says the drum. No aid am I desiring of the loud brazen choiring, of bugle or of trumpet, the lilt and the lyring, and the slow dogged rhythm unending untiring i am rhythm marching rhythm says the drum i am rhythm dogged rhythm and the plotters fill me with them and the two miles an hour that is empire that is power and the slow resistless crawl in the dust cloud choking pall and the marching days that run from the dawn to set of sun and the rifle and the kit and the dragging weight of it and the jaws grimly set and the faces dripping sweat and the how why and when the almighty made for men says the rhythm the marching rhythm of the drum did you call my song barbaric did you mutter out of date when you hear me with the foeman then your cry will come too late here our hearts are beating for you to my pulsing as i come to the rhythm tramping rhythm to the rhythm dogged rhythm to the dogged tramping rhythm of the drum there's a clashing snarling rhythm down the valley broad and ample of the drum kettle drum there's a low swelling rumour that his cavalry a trample here they come here they come to the brassy crash and wrangle to the horseman's clink and jangle and the restive legs beneath them all a welter and a tangle i am rhythm dancing rhythm says the drum white and sorrel roan and dapple hox as shiny as an apple don't they make a splendid showing ears a pricking tails a blowing good boy bless them well they're knowing all my tricks to set them going to my rhythm dancing rhythm says the drum i am rhythm clashing rhythm and the horses fill me with them i'm the foray and the raid i'm the glancing sabre blade now i'm here now i'm there flashing on the unaware how i skulked before the ranks how i cloud along the flanks how the highway spokes behind me let the faint stars tell that find me all night through all night through when the bridles drip with dew i'm the labour toil and pain i'm the loss that shall be gain says the rhythm clashing rhythm of the drum did you speak of useless slaughter did you murmur christian love pray that such as these before you when the war clouds burst above with the bridle on the pommel meet the foemen as they come to the rhythm dashing rhythm to the rhythm crashing rhythm to the crashing dashing rhythm of the drum 
There's an echo shakes the valley, or the rhythm deep and slow of the drum of the drum. Tis the guns, the guns are rolling on the bridges down below. Here they come, here they come. Hark the fellows grind and lumber through the shadows grey and umber, and the triple spans are panting up the slopes the stones encumber, with a rhythm, distant rhythm of the drum. Tis the long shapes of fear that the moonlight silvers here, and the jolting timbers waited with a silent cannoneer. Tis the pipes a piece are passing, O oh, ye people, give an ear, says the rhythm, iron rhythm of the drum. They are rhythm, thunder, rhythm, and they do not need me with them. They can overcome my choir like the borden from the spire. Avant garde am I to these, lords of dreadful revelries, iron cyclops with an eye to confound the earth and sky. Love and fear, love and fear, neither one but both revere, and whatever grace you deal, let it be from courts of steel, said the gun's emplacement then, to expound the law to men, says the rhythm, iron rhythm of the drum. O oh, ye coiners, sentence joiners in a fatty tradesman's land, here's a vangel pentecostal that all nations understand, when they speak before the battle, fools and theories are dumb. God be with them, and the rhythm and the rhythm iron rhythm and the rolling thunder rhythm of the drum there's a rhythm still and turnless with the wind amid the green of the drum muffled drum and there's arms reversed and something neath a flag that goes between as they come as they come just a soldier nothing more such as all the ages bore and as time and tide shall bear them till the sun be sear and hoar says the rhythm muffled rhythm of the drum no more am I requiring of the keen, brazen lyring than taps from the bugle, some shots for the firing. Hats off, stand aside. It is all I am desiring, says the rhythm, muffled rhythm of the drum. I am rhythm, muffled rhythm. Long and deep far well go with him. Hands that bore their portion through, tasks our nature needs must do. Feet that stepped the ancient rhyme of the battle march of time. Blood or tribute, steel or gold, still for victors, as of old. Stern and curt the message runs, taught to sons and sons of sons. Chair a cannon, would you call? What else are we, one and all? Write it thus to close his span. Here there lies a fighting man, says the rhythm, muffled rhythm of the drum. O oh, you farms upon the hillside, and ye cities by the sea, with the laughter of young mothers and the babes about the knee, Tis the heart that once beat for you that is passing still and dumb to the rhythm, muffled rhythm, to the rhythm, solemn rhythm, to the slow and muffled rhythm of the drum. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. If by Bartholomew F. Griffin Read for LibriVox Dot org by Dan McNellan. Suppose twere done, the lanyard pulled on every shotted gun, into the wheeling death clutch sent each millioned armament, to grapple there on land, on sea, and under, and in air. Suppose at last twere come, now while each bourse and shop and mill is dumb and arsenals and dockyards hum now all complete supreme that vast satanic dream each field were trampled soaked each stream died choked each leaguered city and blockaded port made famine's sport the empty wave made reeling dreadnought's grave. Cathedral, castle, gallery, smoking fell neath bomb and shell. In death-like trance lay industry, finance. Two thousand years bequest, achievement, saving disappears. In blood and tears, in widowed woe, that slum and palace equal know. In civilization's suicide, what served thereby, what satisfied? For justice, freedom, right, what wrought? Naught, save after the great cataclysm, perhaps on the world's shaken map, new lines more near or far, binding to king or czar, 
in fostering hate, some newly vassal state, and passion, lust, and pride made satiate, and just a trace of lingering smile on Satan's face. Boston New Bureau, Bartholomew F. Griffin. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Prelude by Edmund McKenna. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Dan McNellan. Embracing the woman I love. I stood by the stream that circles the town I love in the peace of the summer night. And I loved the joyous and cruel leash of life at my throat. And I loved the peace in the soul of the woman I love. And I knew that the net of her beauty was cast in a sea of peace. I loved the silver-blue flood of the moon that flowed over the quiet town, and the trees that shaded the stream and the town I love. For nature is personal always to me, and is never untrue and intrusive. The garrulous, intimate talk of the trees I loved, and the birds asleep in their nests in the trees, and the rosy, wet-mouthed babes that never have minted speech, asleep in the quiet town and kissed by the warm and mothering night. The merry, uncertain, tentative falling leaves that fell on the rocks and the path and were carried laughing away by the musical stream I loved and the sentient gaiety of the flowers I felt were near, and knew my affection I loved, and the neighborly, boisterous wind that trampled in play across the yellowing wheat, and the cattle that lay in the meadow, and the moonlight that hid in the silver sheen of the birch by the gate I loved, and the moonlight that lay like frost that had overslept on the summer grass. And I loved the peaceful, close-breathing, embracing night that breathed the scent of unseen flowers and the fragrance of the woman I love. Ancient and cruel songs passed deathward into the night, and symbols of ancient wrongs went mournfully by and away. And the peace that is finally done with old desires and with conquering, caressingly laid her cheek with illimitable quietude between my cheek and the cheek of the woman I love. And the three of us were one as we stood by the stream in the peace of the summer night. The silence gathered and rolled above us fold upon exquisite fold, till tenderness made me eager to shout and to sing aloud in the positive light of day, and to see the early marching sun brushing the fields and the town I love with his gold-shod feet, and wrapping the flowers and the intimate personal trees in the sudden flame of his breath. Christ, 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 that this day dawned. Peace, 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 raped and mangled and dead, and none to lay a healing hand for easement on her head. War, war, war came with withering day, ancient, Cruel songs from red throats hurled, and none to sing a healing song of peace in all the world. The sunlight is a wound to me, and Jesus Christ has rotted overnight. And peace is now a corpse whose naked body lies half cold upon a shield. The morning wind has grown a hawk's strong claws, and nothing brings my heart so near to breaking as sunlight 
surging over the long grass. The Masses by Edmund McKenna. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Other Army by Bartholomew F. Griffin Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone O'er ruined road, past draggled field, O'er twisted stones of shaken street, Marches an army terrible, The army of the bleeding feet, Of skirted feet that now first leave, Immaculate field and kitchen floor, Old feet that slept beside the hearth, Wee feet that twinkled by the door. To strange world past the parish line, More strange with sound and sight to-day, Recruited fast at every edge, The gathering army takes its way. Commanders, aye, they trudge ahead, not badge but babe on every breast. The troops, they straggle at her skirt, From top to crone in ranks ill-dressed, And uniformed in rusty best, From sedern chests and linen bags, Ah, rough the roads and chill the winds, To sabots split and sudden rags. Equipment, aye, tis furnished well, this army of the old and young, On shoulder bent a bundle small, A doll from little fingers swung. Almost complete, it only lacks The battle oath and cheer and song, Save infant fret and aged sigh, Now dumbly marches it along. Past gaping window, roof and sill, It fares to red horizon's edge, Past blackened furrow, hearth and fane, And fast it grows at every hedge. Boston News Bureau, Bartholomew F. Griffin End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Bugle, E. Sutton, read for LibriVox.org, by Nidhi Prakash. O calling and calling at the rising of the sun, hark the bugle clearly singing with the solo widely winging in the morning just begun. You are going to the flowing of the traffic roaring street, to the toiling and turmoiling, and though toil for man be meet, is it all, is it all thus to plod and feed and crawl, is there not a thought to stray from your task from day to day? Ah, December follows May. Leaves will fall for the glory gone before you, for the mother breast bent o'er you, the good earth that bore you. I call, I call. O oh, calling and calling, as the morning mist unfold, hark the bugles keep upbraiding that true hearts are more than trading. Is there seeming in your dreaming of an endless golden day? Ne'er were pars, ne'er were tars, but uncherished would decay. Follow through, follow through, foaming wake and throbbing screw, all your fair and broad dominions with the seagull's waving pinions. What but swords that did them win once, hold them all? For the thousands years behind you, for the slothful cords that bind you, the future that may find you, I call, I call. O oh, calling and calling, when the twilight stars are born, hark the bugle's fierce complaining, labor, labor, still sustaining, unrequited laugh to scorn. Wheels are humming, you are coming to your fire-lit warmth and ease. Ask the teachers, ask the preachers, who declaim of love and peace. What to do, what to do, if no more my signal blue? by the northern ocean strands on the scorching desert sands, or beneath the tropic land's steamy pall, for your plenteous bin and board now, for all things in order stored now, for ride for the Lord now, I call, I call. O oh, calling and calling when the dark is closing down, 
Hark the bugles clearly crying of the fame beyond all time and the laurel and the crown heroes swarded splendors hoarded by enshrining centuries life or living there's the giving greater love had none than these can it be can it be son of steel on land and sea song and story weft of war woof blood and breed from sires of war proof that ye stand to such a lower proof one and all for the glory gone before you for the mother breast bent o'er you the good earth that bore you i call i call infantry journal e sutton end of poem this recording is in the public domain he went for a soldier by Ruth Comfort Mitchell Read for LibriVox.org by Dan McNellan He marched away with a blithe young score of him with the first volunteers, clear-eyed and clean and sound to the core of him, blushing under the cheers. They were fine new flags that swung a-flying there. Oh, the pretty girls he glimpsed a-crying there. Pelting him with pinks and with roses, Billy the soldier boy. Not very clear in the kind young heart of him what the fuss was about, but the flowers and the flags seemed part of him, the music drowned his doubt. It's a fine brave sight they were a-coming there, to the gay bold tune they kept a-drumming there, while the boasting fifes shrilled jauntily, Billy the soldier boy. Soon he is one with the blinding smoke of it, volley and curse and groan. Then he has done with the nightly joke of it, its rending flesh and bone. There are pain-crazed animals a-shrieking there, and a warm blood stench that is a-reeking there. He fights like a rat in a corner, Billy the soldier boy. There he lies now, like a ghoulish score of him, left on the field for dead. The ground all round is smeared with the gore of him, even the leaves are red. The thing that was Billy lies a-dying there, writhing and a-twisting and a-crying there. A sickening sun grins down on him, Billy the soldier boy. Still not quite clear in the poor wrung heart of him what the fuss was about, See where he lies, or a ghastly part of him, while life is oozing out. There are loathsome things he sees a-crawling there. There are hoarse-voiced crows he hears a-calling there. Eager for the foul feast spread for them, Billy the soldier boy. How much longer, O oh Lord, shall we bear it all? How many more red years? Story it and glory it, and share it all, in seas of blood and tears. They are braggart attitudes we've worn so long, they are tinsel platitudes we've sworn so long, we who have turned the devil's grindstone, born with the hell called war. Smart Set, Ruth Comfort Mitchell End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Six Sonnets by Percy McKay. Read by Lisa Green. Sonnet number one. To William Watson in England. Singer of England's ire across the sea, your austere voice, electric from the deep, speaks our own yearning and our spirits sweep to Europe's allied honor. Painfully bowed with a planet's lonely burden, we held our hot hearts in leash, but now they leap, their band like young hounds belling from their keep, to bait the tootin' wolf of tyranny. What? Would he throw us sops of sugared art and poisoned commerce snarling? So lie still till I have shown my fangs and torn the heart of half the world and gorged my sanguine fill. Now England, let him see, rages he will, he cannot tear 
are plighted souls apart. Sonnet number two, American Neutrality. How shall we keep an armed neutrality with our own souls? Our souls belie our lips that seek to hold our passion in eclipse and hide the wound of our sharp sympathy, saying, One's neighbor differs, he might be kindled to wrath. Were one to wield the whips of truth? Great God, a red apocalypse flames on the blinded world, and what do we? Peace, do we cry? Peace is the godlike plan we love and dedicate our children to. Yet England's cause is ours, the rights of man, which little Belgium battles for anew. Shall we recant? No. Being American, our souls cannot keep neutral and keep true. Sonnet number three, peace. Peace, but there is no peace. To hug the thought is but to clasp a lover who thinks lies. Go, look your earnest neighbor in the eyes, and read the answer there. Peace is not bought by distance from the fight. Peace must be fought and bled for. Tis a dream whose horrid price is haggled for by dread realities. Peace is not paid till dreamers are distraught. Would we not close our ears against these ills, urging our hearts, be calm. America is called soon to rebuild a world. But how shall we nobly build with neutral wills? Can we be calm while Belgian anguish thrills? Or would we crown with peace? Caligula. Sonnet number four, Wilson. Patience, but peace of heart we cannot choose, nor would he wish us cravenly to keep aloof in soul, who, large in statesmanship and justice, sent our ships to Vera Cruz. Patience must wring our hearts while we refuse to launch our country on that crimson deep, which breaks the dikes of Europe, but we sleep, watchful, still waiting by the awful fuse. Wisdom, he counsels, and he counsels well, whose patient fortitude against the fret and sneer of time has stood inviolable. We love his goodness and will not forget. With him, we pause beside the mouth of hell. The wolf of Europe has not triumphed yet. Sonnet number five, Kruppism. Crowned on the twilight battlefield there bends a crooked iron dwarf and delves for gold, chuckling, one hundred thousand gatlings sold. And the moon rises, and a moaning rends, the mangled living, and the dead distends, and a child cowers on the chartless wold, where searching in his safety vault of mold, the cobalt kaiser cuts his dividends. We, who still wage his battles are his thralls, and dying do him homage, yea, and give daily our living souls to be enticed into his power. So long as on war's walls we build engines of death that he may live, so long shall we serve Krupp instead of Christ. Sonnet number six, The Real Germany. Bismarck, or wrapped Beethoven with his dreams, Ah, which was blind, or which bespoke his race, that breed which nurtured Heinz haunting grace, and Goethe, mastering Olympic themes of meditation, Mozart's golden gleams, and Leibniz charting realms of time and space, great-hearted Schiller, and that fairy brace of brothers who first trailed the goblin streams. Bismarck, for these builded an iron tomb and clanged the door and turned a Kaiser's key. And simple folk that once danced merrily their May ring rites march now in roaring gloom toward that renascent dawn when the black womb of buried guns gives birth to Germany. Boston Transcript by Percy McKay. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Litany of Nations by William Griffith 
Read for LibriVox.org by Deanna Lee. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, and shall be chased before the wind. Isaiah. Greece. Eons of old were wandering down the seas, when Homer sang at Chios, and the sweet tranquility of marching silences was broken at my feet. Great dawns have shown the way when we have wandered. God in the battle sway, what have we squandered? Italy. Avid and Roman, born in soul and sense, Master of all else but myself was I, when, bound by silken cords of indolence, I saw the world go by. France Ravaging, roistering, and repenting, save, in story and the regions of romance, rises the moon on whom more mad and brave or beautiful than France. Germany once German arms and German armies hurled, thunders on Rome. Then mine no readier hand would wake the violin and woo the world, were it a fairyland. Austria-Hungary Mine is a house divided, but upheld, by the sheer force of many hemming powers. Ages like forests have been hewn and felled, to build my crumbling towers. Russia. Gray winters flourish and old empires fail, and still the starry watchmen sally forth, as wardens with me of the frozen grail and ramparts of the north. Balkan States. Stabbing the skies for stars and air in which to bask a while and breathe, shall we remain simply the little brothers of the rich? God, have we fought in vain? Spain. Strong was my soul in war and wise in peace. On whom else was the Moslem vanguard hurled? Oh, but for me had any Genoese sailed and brought back a world? Switzerland. High noons and sunset pass while I repeat the world-old secret of the endless quest. And with the nations aging at my feet, I overlook the West. Great Britain Flecking the seas where war and tempest brew, And biding till the gonfalons are furled, My British sails have dared and driven through Thunders that shook the world. America Westward the tide of empire ebbs and flows, And westward where the new world torches rise, and rout the night, the great day dawning glows, and kindles in my eyes. Japan Amid the warring peoples I that slept, and dreamt of wide dominion, confident, ambitious, urging, conquering, have stepped out from the Orient. China Glory and power for ages had been mine, until upon me fell a sudden night, such as makes Beacon Star Republic shine, and my eyes saw the light. Turkey In infidel debate on whence and why, they hiss my God and know not whether hail, and wise or worn and withering am I behind the crimson veil. Great dawns have shown the way when we have wandered. God in the battle sway what have we squandered? The International William Griffith End of Poem This recording is in the public domain. To the Necrophile by Walter Conrad Arnsberg After reading the affectionate desire of Germany to get closer to France, expressed by the German Secretary of State, to the British Ambassador at Berlin, as published in the British White Papers. With love are you gone mad, O lover of France, that you should be embracing with your arms her gory body for the gore that warms only a monster in his dalliance? Alas, 
She is alive with her alarms, unwilling yet for the enraged romance. Assault her sacredness of Paris, lance her flank with such a wound as has its charms. For you who want for your obscene amour, the body of a soul that is not yours. For you who want a wound to enter by, for you who want a corpse upon your heart, coupling with France if France would only die, not yours the human vow, till death do us part. The Trend, Walter Conrad Arnsberg. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Louvain by Oliver Herford. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. Bleeding and torn, ravished with sword and flame by that blasphemer prince who with the name of God upon his lips betrayed the state he falsely swore to hold inviolate, made mad by pride and reckless of the rod, shaking his mailed fist in the face of God. But not in vain her martyrdom, Louvain, like the brave maid of France, shall rise again, Above her clotted hair a crown shall shine, From her dark ashes rise a hallowed shrine, Where pilgrims from far lands shall heal their pain, Shrived by the sacred sorrow of Louvain. Harper's Weekly, Oliver Herford End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Ancient Sacrifice by Malin Leonard Fisher Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee Ye dead and gone great armies of the world, Sweet gleam the fields where ye were used to pass, With death for leader legion like the grass, Day after day by dews of morning pearled, Ye dead and gone great armies, ye were hurled Gainst other armies, great and dead and gone. In awful dark ye died before the dawn, Ne'er knowing how your flags in peace are furled. Ye are the tall, fair forests that were felled To build a pyre for strife that it might cease. Ye are the white lambs, slaughtered to bring peace ye are the sweet ships sunk that storm be quelled and ye are lilies plucked and set like stars about the blood-stained shrine of bygone wars and of poem this recording is in the public domain The Pipes of the North by E. Sutton Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Do you hear them sternly sounding Through the noises of the street? O oh, harp from the heather overseas! Do ye leap up to greet em? Does your pulse skip a beat? There's a lad with a plaid and naked knees here where all is strange and foreign to the swing of kilt and sporran with his head proud and high and a lightning in his eye he's skirling em he's dirling em he's blowing like a storm o oh, pipes of the north o oh, the pibroch pouring forth you're fierce and loud as winter but ye make the blood run warm all the battle names of story, all the jewel names of song, down the spate of the clamour swing and reel, and the claymores come a-flashing for a thousand years along, from Canmore to Bonnie Charlie and Lochiel, though the high singing bugle and the brazen crashing fugle with the drum and the fife 
wake the tramping lions to life but neighing em and braying em and shattering all the air o oh, pipes of the north when the legions thunder forth there's naught like ye to lift em on to death or glory there now he tunes an ancient ditty for the leal highland lover a rill of the mountain clear and pure how the bee is in the blossom and the peewit passing over and the cloud shadows chasing on the moor hark the carol of the chanter rollicking a skelting chanter and the hum of the drones with their wind arising tones he's flighting em he's kiting em he's flinging gay and free o oh, pipes of the north when the reel comes tumbling forth tis the breeze amid the bracken or the wavelets on the sea now hark the wrenching sob of it the wild with all regret o oh, heart from the heather over seas for the homeland of your fathers though you've never known it yet tween the tay and the outer hebrides o oh, the rugged misty highlands o oh, the grim and lonely islands and the solemn fir and pine and the grey tormented brine he's trailing em he's wailing em to tear your bosom's core o oh, pipes of the north when the long lament goes forth no sorrows left to utter for the tongue can say no more o oh, breton pipes are clear and strong and irish pipes are sweet and soft upon the heather over seas but the scottish a eh, can take your throat or make ye swing your feet o oh, hark the lads a paddling on the keys see him footing straight and proud through the wonder gawking crowd with his feathered glengarry like a gun at the carry he's belling em he's yelling em he's skirling high to you o oh, pipes of the north o oh, the wild notes rushing forth you're sure the wings of gaelic souls as far as blood is true scribner's magazine e sutton end of poem this recording is in the public domain out of babylon by clinton scollard read for librivox dot org by alan mapstone as i stole out of babylon beyond the stolid warders my soul that dwelt in babylon long long ago the sound of cymbals and of lutes of vials and recorders came up from khan and caravan loud and low as i crept out of babylon the clangour and the babel the strife of life the haggling in the square and mart of the men who went in saffron and the men who went in sable it tore me and it wore me yea it wore my heart as i fled out of babylon the cubits of the towers they seemed a very mockery to bar my way the incense of the altars and the hanging garden flowers they lured me with their glamour but i would not stay we still flee out of babylon its vending and its vying its crying up to mammon its bowing down to baal we still flee out of babylon its sobbing and its sighing where the strong grow ever stronger and the weary fail we still flee out of babylon the feverish the fretful that saps the sweetness of the soul and leaves but a rind we still flee out of babylon and fain would be forgetful of all within that thrall of war threatening behind o oh, babylon o oh, babylon your toiling and your teeming your canyons and your wonder wealth not for such as we we who have fled from babylon contented are with dreaming dreaming of earth's loveliness happy to be free the bellman clinton scollard end of poem this recording is in the public domain
Funere Mersit Acerbo by Ruth Shepherd Phelps. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. Written by Jesui Carducci at the death of his little son Dante, and addressed to his brother Dante, who had taken his own life years before. O oh, thou among the Tuscan hills asleep, laid with our father in one grassy bed, faintly through the green sod above thy head, hast thou not heard a plaintive child's voice weep? It is my little son, at thy dark keep he knocketh, he who wore thy name, thy dread and sacred name, he too this life hath fled, whose ways, my brother, thou didst find so steep among the flower borders as he played by sunny childish visions smiled upon the shadow caught him to that world how other thy world long since so now to that chill shade o oh, welcome him as backward towards the sun he turns his head to look and call his mother the bellman Ruth Shepherd Phelps. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Afterwards by Marilyn Leonard Fisher. Read for LibriVox.org by M. Lee. There was a day when death to me meant tears and tearful takings leave that had to be, and awed embarkings on an unshored sea, and sudden disarrangement of the years. But now I know that nothing interferes with the fixed forces when a tired man dies, that death is only answerings and replies, the chiming of a bell which no one hears the casual slanting of a half-spent sun the soft recessional of noise and coil the coveted something time nor age can spoil i know it is a fabric finely spun between the stars and dark to seize and keep such glad romances as we read in sleep and of poem this recording is in the public domain evening by charlotte wilson read for librivox dot org by larry wilson go little sorrows from the evening wood faint odors rise that touch the heart like tears with inarticulate comfort Lo, she bears a weary load, small cares that drug the blood, small envies, sick desires for lesser good. All day till now the evening reappears. They drop away, and she with wonder rears her aching height from needless servitude. The treetops are all music. Light and soft the brook's small feet go tinkling toward the sea, bearing the little day's distress afar while yonder in the stillness set aloft my one great grief still glimmering down on me smiles tremulous as a bereaved star yale review charlotte wilson in the poem this recording is in the public domain lights through the mist by william rose benet read for librivox dot org by larry wilson some for the sadness and sweetness of far evening bells seeming to call a tryst yet for my choice all the comfort and kindness that wells from lights through the mist in the dim dusk so unreal that it seems like a dream hard for the heart to resist mellowing the pain of the close drawing darkness they stream lights through the mist Blurred to new beauty, the blues and the browns and the greys shimmer with soft amethyst. Then God's own glory of gold 
as it shines through the haze, lights through the mist. Century William Rose Benet End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Twelve Forty Five by Joyce Kilmer. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. For Edward J. Wheeler. Within the Jersey City shed, the engine coughs and shakes its head. The smoke, a plume of red and white, waves madly in the face of night. And now the grave, incurious stars gleam on the groaning, hurrying cars. Against the kind and awful rain of darkness, this our angry train, a noisy little rebel pouts, its brief defiance flames and shouts, and passes on and leaves no trace for darkness holds its ancient place serene and absolute the king unchanged of every living thing the houses lie obscure and still in rutherford and carlton hill our lamps intensify the dark of slumbering passaic park and quiet holds the weary feet that daily tramp through prospect street what though we clang and clank and roar through all passaic streets no door will open not an eye will see who this loud vagabond may be upon my crimson cushioned seat in manufactured light and heat i feel unnatural and mean outside the towns are cool and clean curtained awhile from sound and sight they take god's gracious gift of night the stars are watchful over them on clifton as on bethlehem the angels leaning down the sky shed peace and gentle dreams and i i ride i blasphemously ride through all the silent countryside the engines shriek the headlights glare pollute the still nocturnal air the cottages of lakeview sigh and sleeping frown as we pass by why even strident patterson rests quietly as any nun her foolish warring children keep the grateful armistice of sleep for what tremendous errand's sake are we so blatantly awake what precious secret is our freight what king must be abroad so late perhaps death roams the hills to-night and we rush forth to give him fight or else perhaps we speed his way to some remote unthinking prey perhaps a woman writhes in pain and listens listens for the train the train that like an angel sings the train with healing on its wings now hawthorne the conductor cries our neighbour starts and rubs his eyes he hurries yawning through the car and steps out where the houses are this is the reason for our quest not wantonly we break the rest of town and village nor do we lightly profane night's sanctity what love commands the train fulfils and beautiful upon the hills are these our feet of burnished steel subtly and certainly i feel that glenrock welcomes us to her and silent ridgewood seems to stir and smile because she knows the train has brought her children back again we carry people home and so god speed us wheresoe'er we go ho hocus waldwick allendale lift sleepy heads to give us hail in ramsey mawa suffer and stand houses that wistfully demand a father's son some human thing that this the midnight train may bring the trains that travel in the day they hurry folk to work or play the midnight train is slow and old but of it let this thing be told to its high honour be it said it carries people home to bed my cottage lamp shines white and clear god bless the train that brought me here smart set joyce kilmer end of poem this recording is in the public domain
The Last Demand by Faith Baldwin Life, you have bruised me and chilled me. Fate, you have jeered at my pain. Dreams, you have mocked while you thrilled me. So I turn to the battle again. Love, you have blessed me and led me. The lips that have kissed you, you smite. Hope, you have urged me and fled me. But left is the joy of the fight never was i a coward now must i prove my worth world i give you my courage not tears but a hard-bought mirth work of my hands i grant you labor and toil a brain but heart and soul shall be wanting for they are dead of pain forward a fight to the death then life is a sorry jest ahead to the thick of tumult Fate is a fool at the best. Courage, the war gods are greatest. Love is a false fair light. To arms, for dreams are frail bubbles, and hope but a song in the night. World, I cast down the gauntlet, for you were made to defy. Own me a foe for your metal. Ah, fighting, let me die. Love, hope, and dreams I give you life i fling at your feet i will drink to the dregs of the bitter for once i had tasted of sweet of one last taunt i shall rob you stern i will claim my due one recompense you shall give me balm i will snatch from you tis neither fame nor glory toys to break and regret i demand to conquer memory i demand that i forget the smart set faith baldwin end of poem this recording is in the public domain godspeed by jane belfield read for LibriVox.org by deanna lee the soul speaks body of mine and must i lay thee low so long I have looked out from my dear eye, ears that have brought me song, and willing hands, and feet that carried me to pleasant fields. Shall dust claim all, and must I say goodbye? Godspeed. The body speaks. Sister of mine, I go from whence I came, perchance to bloom again, or if required, when time is ripe, to house another soul. Thou art more wise than I, yet reckoth not, O soul of mine, that I, at last, am tired. Godspeed. Southern Women's Magazine, Jane Belfield. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. At the End of the Road by Madison Cowine Read for LibriVox.org by Winifred Aspen This is the truth as I see it, my dear, Out in the wind and the rain. They who have nothing have little to fear, Nothing to lose or to gain. Here by the road at the end of the year, Let us sit down and drink of our beer, happy-go-lucky and her cavalier, out in the wind and the rain. Now we are old, hey, isn't it fine, out in the wind and the rain? Now we have nothing, why snivel and whine? What would it bring us again? When I was young, I took you like wine, held you and kissed you and thought you divine. Happy-go-lucky, the habit's still mine, out in the wind and the rain. Oh, my old heart, what a life we have led, out in the wind and the rain. How we have drunken and how we have fed, nothing to lose or to gain. Cover the fire now, get we to bed, long is the journey and far has it led. Come, let us sleep, lass, sleep like the dead, out in the wind and the rain. The Bellman, Madison Cowine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Path Flower by Olive Tilford Dargon. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. A redcap sang in Bishop's Wood, a lark o'er Golders Lane, as I the April pathway trod, bound west for Willesden. At foot each tiny blade grew big, and taller stood to hear, and every leaf on every twig was like a little ear. As I too paused, and both ways tried to catch the rippling rain, so still a hare kept at my side his tussock of disdain. Behind me close I heard a step, a soft pit-pat surprise, and looking round my eyes fell deep into sweet other eyes. The eyes like wells, where sun lies too, so clear and trustful brown, without a bubble warning you that here's a place to drown. How many miles, her broken shoes, had told me of more than one. She answered like a dreaming muse, I came from Islington. So long a tramp, two gentle nods, then seemed to lift a wing, and words fell soft as willow buds. I came to find the spring. A timid voice, yet not afraid, in ways so sweet to roam, as it with honey-bees had played, and could no more go home. Her home. I saw the human lair, I heard the huckster's ball, I stifled with the thickened air of bickering mart and stall. Without a tuppence for a ride, her feet had set her free. Her rags, that decency defied, seemed new with liberty. But she was frail. Who would might note that trail of hungering that for an hour she had forgot in wonder of the spring? So shriven by her joy she glowed, it seemed a sin to chat. A tea-shop snuggled off the road. Why did I think of that? Oh, frail, so frail, I could have wept. But she was passing on, and I but muddled. You'll accept a penny for a bun? Then up her little throat a spray of rose climbed for it bust, a wilding lost till safe it lay, hid by her curls of rust and I saw modesties at fence with pride that bore no name. So old it was she knew not whence it sudden woke and came. But that which shone of all most clear was startled, sadder thought that I should give her back the fear of life she had forgot. And I blush for the world we'd made, putting God's hand aside, till for the want of sun and shade his little children died and blushed that I, who every year with spring went up and down, must greet a soul that ached for her with penny for a bun, struck as a thief in holy place whose sin upon him cries. I watch the flowers leave her face, the song go from her eyes. Then she, sweetheart, she saw my rout, and of charity a hand of grace put softly out and took the coin from me. A red cap sang in Bishop's Wood, a lark or Golders Lane. But I alone still glooming stood, and April plucked in vain. Till living words rang in my ears, and sudden music played. Out of such sacred thirst as hers, the world shall be remade. Afar she turned her head and smiled, as might have smiled the spring and humbled as a wondering child, I watched her vanishing. Atlantic Monthly, Olive Tilford Dargan End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Godmaker Man by Don Marquis Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Never more shall the shepherds of Arcady follow Pan's moods as he lulls by the shore of the mere, or lies hid in the hollow. Never more shall they start at the sound of his reed-fashioned flute. Fallen mute are the strings of Apollo, his lyre and his lute, and the lips of the Memnons are mute, 
evermore and the gods of the north are they dead or forgetful are odin and baldor and thor are they drunk or grown weary of worship and fretful are odin and baldor and thor and into what night have the orient deities strayed you short gods of the nile in dust splendours arrayed brooding isis and sombre osiris you were gone ere the fragile papyrus that bragged you eternal decayed the avatars but illuming their limited evens and vanished like plunging stars they are fixed in the whirling heavens no firmer than falling stars brief lords of the changing soul they pass like a breath from the face of a glass or a blossom of summer blown shallop like over the clover and tossed tides of grass sink to silence the psalms and the paeans the shibboleth shift and the faiths and the temples that challenge the aeons are tenanted only by wraiths swoon to silence the cymbals and psalters the worship grows senseless and strange and the mockers ask where be thy altars crying nothing is changeless but change yea nothing seems changeless but change and yet through the creed-wrecking years one story for ever appears the tale of a city supernal the whisper of something eternal a passion a hope and a vision that people the silence with powers a fable of meadows elysian where time enters not with his hours manifold are the tale's variations race and clime ever tinting the dreams yet its essence through endless mutations immutable gleams deathless though godheads be dying surviving the creeds that expire illogical reason defying lives that passionate primal desire insistent persistent for ever man cries to the silences never shall death reign the lord of the soul shall the dust be the ultimate goal i will storm the black bastions of night i will tread where my vision has trod i will set in the darkness a light in the vastness a god as the skull of the man grows broader so do his creeds and his gods they are shaped in his image and mirror his needs and he clothes them with thunders and beauty he clothes them with music and fire seeing not as he bows to their altars that he worships his own desire and mixed with his trust there is terror and mixed with his madness is ruth and every man grovels in error yet every man glimpses a truth for all of the creeds are false and all of the creeds that are true and lo at the shrines where my brothers bow there will i bow too for no form of a god and no fashion man has made in his desperate passion but is worthy some worship of mine not too hot with a gross belief nor yet too cold with pride i will bow me down where my brothers bow humble but open-eyed Evening Sun, Don Marquis. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Section 78 of Anthology of Magazine Verse for 1914. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc D. L. Martin. Anthology of Magazine Verse for 1914. Edited by William Stanley Braithwaite. Section 78. The Best Poetry of 1914. 1. 
10 books of poetry for a small library. Asterisk. Certain volumes of new poetry and collected editions are drawn to the individual reader's notice by an asterisk employed to indicate special poetic distinction. Asterisk. The East I Know by Paul Claudel. Translated from the French by Teresa Francis and William Rose Benet. Yale University Press, $1.25 net. A volume of prose poems by one of the greatest poets living in the world today. Although Paul Claudel is unknown to English readers, his influence is the strongest shaping force there is on the young poetry of most European countries. This volume is as much of a literary event as the publication of John Singe's first volume in this country. I know of no living writer whom we may more confidently predict immortality for his work. The present volume reveals the soul of China in wonderful strophes, and though perhaps the slightest of Claudel's books is the volume by which Claudel may be most fittingly introduced to the American public. If any reader can set down this volume without realizing that a great new force in literature and life has been born into the world, he is incapable of imaginative appreciation. Asterisk the Single Hound, Poems of a Lifetime, by Emily Dickinson, Little Brown and Company, $1.25 net, a new volume by one of the world's great spiritual artists, which contains much poetry that is imperishable as an integral part of American literature. With Blake's naked, uncompromising vision and his absorption in the eternal shadows of mortality, she has a personal and fragrant beauty of feeling and expression which is unique and incomparable. Her verses are like flashes of lightning, illumining the chaos of our material existence. The single hound is the rich legacy of a great spiritual imagination. There are few books in American poetry of which we can more confidently predict immortality. Asterisk. Collected Poems by Norman Gale, Macmillan, $1.50, net. The poet's choice of the lyrics and longer poems by which he wishes to be definitely remembered. Indispensable to every library. No poet since the Elizabethans has managed to convey such an infectious joy into pastoral poetry, and the best of these poems are permanent treasure trove for the anthologist. Such a volume as this would alone dignify a season. Asterisk. Georgian Poetry, edited by E. M. Putnam, $1.50 net. A superb collection of representative poems by the younger English writers who have won their reputation in the last four or five years. This book, which has gone through nine English editions already, should meet with as great success in this country. Here and here only will you find the authentic younger singers adequately represented by hitherto unpublished work. If this volume introduces Rupert Brooke and LaSalle Abercrombie to America, it will have done our literature a service great enough to justify its publication. Asterisk, The Congo and Other Poems by Vachel Lindsay, Macmillan, $1.25 net, a new volume of verse by Mr. Lindsay, whose first book was the most significant publication in American poetry last year. While this book does not mark an advance, many of the poems written to be chanted aloud fully sustain the poet's reputation, and the volume is graced with a selection of the best and less strident of the rhymes to be traded for bread. As the poetic interpreter of the Middle West, Mr. Lindsay is performing a great social service as well as a great service to poetry by bringing it into the homes and hearts of the people. 
the fireman's ball and I heard Emmanuel singing have qualities of permanence and in the former Mr. Lindsay has perfected a new medium, poetic expression. But we are in danger of losing sight of Mr. Lindsay's more delicate talent by virtue of which he is preeminently a poet. Asterisk, The Present Hour, A Book of Poems by Percy McKay, Macmillan, $1.25 net. The poems dealing with the present war reaffirm Mr. McKay's authority of utterance, and the best of the sonnets surpass William Watson's The Purple East. But it is in fight and school that the poet has at last found himself and invented a medium admirably fitted to express what he desires. These two poems have all the distinction of Maysfield, with the originality and shrewdness of New England feeling, and a homeliness which is unique in contemporary poetry. The volume includes many poems of occasion, all adequate, and in the case of Goethe's and one or two others, noble. So far, Mr. McKay's best volume of poems. Asterisk, The Complete Poems of S. Weir Mitchell, Century Company. Two dollars net. The definitive edition of Dr. Mitchell's poetry revised according to his final wishes. It should serve to make known to the present generation the graceful contemplative poetry of that rival to America's other distinguished physician poet, Dr. Holmes. Dr. Mitchell's poems of occasion at their best are equal to the best of Dr. Holmes while his ode to a Lycian tomb surpasses the chambered Nautilus. It is one of the anomalies of literature that Dr. Mitchell's novels have so long overshadowed his poetry. In this volume, the best of his dramatic work is included, and Drake is a play of poetic distinction in its way. The volume may rest pleasantly with its peers on the same library shelf with the poems of Longfellow and Holmes, it is the harvest of sixty years devoted to poetry. Asterisk, Songs for the New Age by James Oppenheim, Century Company, $1.25 net. The most significant volume of new poetry of the year, 1914, as Vachel Lindsay's General William Booth enters into heaven, was the most significant volume of 1913. With more self-conscious art than Whitman, in the verse form which Whitman once thought to have perfected, Mr. Oppenheim sings the joys and sorrows of the race, now and to come. The vision of these poems is swift and sure, their philosophy mature and American. If there is one volume of verse this year which we might safely recommend to every American man and woman, who has not read poetry before, it is this book, where they will find their dreams and strivings sung and interpreted in a book which has qualities of greatness. The form of these poems is so difficult to shape perfectly that Mr. Oppenheim's technical achievement can only be characterized as masterly. The volume is the only one in which the use of polyrhythmic verse can claim complete justification since leaves of grass, and its art is as individual as its matter. Songs for the New Age may reaffirm much of Whitman, but they do not echo him. The volume will prove more and more satisfying with each rereading, and its message to the American people may not pass unheeded. Asterisk, The Grand Canyon and Other Poems by Henry Van Dyke, Scribner, $1.25 net. Poetry of the quality familiar to Dr. Van Dyke's readers and fully equal to the poetry in his earlier volumes. To the more serious poems are added several delightfully humorous poems of occasion, among which Ars Agricolaris is a classic of its kind. Asterisk, The Flight and Other Poems by George Edward Woodbury, Macmillan, $1.25 net. 
Mr. Woodbury's finest volume of verse, in which he gives expression to many moods of intellectual beauty and a philosophy of the ideal akin to Shelley. It contains one lyric, Comrades, absolutely peerless and worthy to be set beside Browning's The Guardian Angel, if it does not surpass it. These poems are the fruit of a ripe culture and a passionate idealism thoroughly American in its voicing of its message, one of the most completely satisfying volumes of the year. End of section 78. Section 79 of Anthology of Magazine Verse for 1914. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc D. L. Martin. Anthology of Magazine Verse for 1914. Edited by William Stanley Braithwaite. Section 79. 2. 25 Books of Poetry for a Larger Library. The list of ten books printed above and the following fifteen titles. Asterisk, In Deep Places, by Amelia Josephine Burr, Doran, One Dollar Net, Fine Dramatic Monologues and Narrative Poems, which represent a great advance over Miss Burr's previous book. Jehain is a worthy sequel to The Haystack and the Floods by William Morris. Allah is with the patient, and other narrative poems are related in a blank verse of firm yet varied texture. Miss Burr's dramatic imagination interprets Italy and England in human terms, and travel has afforded her lyric opportunities, to which she has responded sensitively and well. With this volume, Miss Burr has come to stay. Asterisk. The Little King by Witter Binner, Kennerly, 60 cents net, a stark one-act play in verse of swift, sure, dramatic nerve about the little son of Marie Antoinette, with great economy of material and vivid historic imagination, Mr. Binner has made the little king human and poignant in his brief little tragedy. Asterisk, Earth Deities and Other Rhythmic Masks by Bliss Carmen and Mary Perry King, Kennerly, $1.50 net, Four Masks of Earth, with Mr. Carmen's old familiar lyric quality directed into fresh and living channels. Each of them would afford a rare delight to an audience, particularly if accompanied by the rhythmic dances which have been designed for them by Mary Perry King. Asterisk, Poetical Works, by Edward Dowden, in two volumes, Dutton, four dollars net, a permanent and integral part of English literature. It is gratifying to find tardy justice done at last to the merits of the late Professor Dowden as a poet. Those who care for the work of Mr. Woodbury will find the same qualities in Dowden's poetry, but in a larger and more authoritative voice. Moreover, he is one of the great 19th century sonneteers. His many hymns to intellectual beauty have not an undistinguished line in them, and as a lyric poet, his singing quality is infectious. This is the first edition of his poems since 1876 and contains many which have never been collected before. The second volume is a pleasant translation of Goethe's the West Eastern Divan. It will not greatly interest admirers of Professor Dowden's work and should be sold separately. Asterisk, Borderlands and Thoroughfares by Wilfred Wilson Gibson, Macmillan, $1.25 net. Mr. Gibson's fourth volume in three years. Though not equal to his earlier books, it will well repay the lover of poetry. The first section, entitled Borderlands, consists of three dramatic dialogues in free verse, which aim with some success to be simple, sensuous, and passionate. 
Hoops is one of Mr. Gibson's most satisfactory poems. The second section, entitled Thoroughfares, comprises shorter poems, many of which are dramatic monologues, and of these, Solway Ford and the Gorse represent Mr. Gibson's best. As we have said elsewhere, Mr. Gibson's art satisfies our aesthetic emotions and fulfills our social needs. Asterisk, Around the Bereans, a little book of Celtic verse by Agnes I. Hanrahan. Badger, one dollar net, a slight volume of Irish songs equal to the very best by Eva Gorbooth or Mrs. Hinkson and tipped with a more delicate art. The volume should be on every shelf beside Maura O'Neill's Songs of the Glens of Antrim. Asterisk, The Cry of Youth, by Harry Kemp, Kennerly, $1.25, net. Terse ringing ballads of modern life with much of Buchanan's quality and keen technique. Despite the propagandist note, which is less insistent than in most poetry of a socialistic tendency, Mr. Kemp has succeeded with some quiet reserve in making the reader feel the pity of lonely outcast life and in expressing his philosophy in genuine poetry. The sincerity of his work is unquestionable, and the volume merits a critical attention on its merits, which we should be anxious to assist. The Cry of Youth is not written solely for an audience of poets and critics. It is genuine poetry of cruelly naked emotion born unflinchingly. Asterisk, Songs of the Dead End by Patrick McGill Kennerly, $1.25 net Poetry of Labor and Poetry Without Brief in About Equal Measure Though the former is fine, Mr. McGill's best work is to be found in the latter. The poet has been a navvy, a miner, a switchman, a car coupler, a tramp, and a plate layer, and out of grinding poverty and toil his poetry has emerged. There is danger of a wrong emphasis on his social poetry. It is good, but not better than that of several others. The less premeditated lyrics will give the greatest pleasure to the reader, and to many of them one will turn again and again. Asterisk, Philip the King and Other Poems by John Maysfield Macmillan, $1.25 net A one-act play in verse which is competent but would not be distinctive were it not for a superb ballad of the Armada which challenges comparison with Drayton. Four other poems of strong beauty which redeem the rest of the volume and make it necessary to poetry lovers. The notable war poem entitled August 1914 is included. Asterisk, The Wine Press, A Tale of War by Alfred Noyes. Stokes, 60 cents net. A Tale of the Horror of War and Its blind futility, whose scene is laid in the Balkans. It is told with all of Mr. Noyes's art, and its awful lesson should be particularly timely in the midst of the present struggle. The poem is a hymn to liberty passionately voiced, and brings death and suffering home in relentless poetry. Asterisk, Songs of Labor and Other Poems, by Morris Rosenfeld. Translated from the Yiddish by Rose Pastor Stokes and Helena Frank. Badger, 75 cents net. An excellent translation of the poems of an American Yiddish poet of poignant beauty, whose work has hitherto not been accessible to English readers except in an incomplete prose version. The present translation includes many poems now published for the first time, and is adorned with two remarkable illustrations in black and white, which reveal new possibilities in line, a volume which deserves to go through many editions. Asterisk, Poems by Clinton Scollard, Houghton Mifflin, $1.25 net, a selection of Mr. Scollard's best poems from his numerous volumes. It should serve to define his place in American poetry, 
which is beside Mr. Cowan. Delicate fancy and a love of nature, which is not vague, are united to an opulence of expression, which has not always done Mr. Scholard service, but which in almost every poem in this volume results in giving the pleasure of fine poetic sensation to the discriminating reader. Songs and Sonnets for England in Wartime Lane, 75 cents net A collection of the best poems by English poets inspired by the war issued for the benefit of the Prince of Wales Fund. The total profits of the volume are turned over to this fund for relief work and the purchaser will not only procure a volume whose significance will be more and more realized as time passes, but will be contributing in small measure to this charitable work. Asterisk, Challenge, by Lewis Untermeyer, Century Company, $1 net, one of the most significant new volumes of the year, with much of Shelley's social enthusiasm and a genuine inspiration, he sings the strength and weakness of our democracy with the eagerness of youth. This is a volume whose significance will grow as the years go by, and it should be associated with Mr. Oppenheim's new volume, on which comment will be found elsewhere. Although democracy is the substance of his song, yet the feeling for beauty's essence, which here finds lyrical expression, is the most substantially satisfying quality of his work. End of section 79section 80 of anthology of magazine verse for 1914 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by doc d r martin anthology of magazine verse for 1914 edited by william stanley braithwaite section 83 Supplementary List of Significant Books of Poetry for a Large Library Asterisk Earth Triumphant and Other Tales in Verse by Conrad Aiken Macmillan $1.25 net Three Narrative Poems of Distinction Followed by Shorter Poems Interpreting the Philosophy of Youth they suggest comparison with the longer poems of John Maysfield, but have a firm, independent technique of their own. With genuine beauty, they relate tales which reveal the heart of modern life in various phases of youth and contain a reading of earth which differs in essentials from that of Meredith. The volume deserves a wider audience than the usual public which cares for poetry. It has a message which every American will appreciate, and if it helps to spread an interest in poetry among new circles of readers, it will only be fulfilling its mission. It is a distinguished first book of verse. Poems by Walter Conrad Ehrensberg, Houghton Mifflin, One Dollar Net. The most artistic volume of poetry this year in its technique aloofness, controlled emotion, conscious art, are the characteristics of his poetry. Despite an occasional bazarie, despite echoes of Verlaine and Laforgue, Mr. Arnsberg is a classicist. His technique is faultless. Each line is not only exquisite in itself, but it is perfectly coordinated with every other line. If these poems leave the reader cold, they offer an abundant intellectual compensation for the thrills of other poets. The special qualities of his verse are unique in American poetry and will surely appeal to a discriminating circle, though his work is unlikely to become popular. The Minor Poems of Joseph Beaumont, edited by Eloise Robinson, Houghton Mifflin, $5 net, an authoritative text of Joseph Beaumont's minor poems edited from a manuscript in the possession of Professor George Herbert Palmer. 
The poems are preceded by a critical introduction and followed by a brief but careful textual apparatus. While Beaumont was a very minor poet, the fact remains that he was a significant member of the group of metaphysical poets of whom Vaughan was the greatest and this volume must take its place in any collection of English poetry which claims to be even reasonably complete. The Falconer of God and Other Poems by William Rose Benet, Yale University Press, $1.25 net. Mr. Benet's second collection marks an advance in facility combined with a greater restraint and reticence. It includes many fine ballads and several dramatic soliloquies only surpassed this year by those in Miss Burr's new volume. Although there is much which is experimental in the book, it is successful experiment, and Mr. Benet's range of expression is continually broadening. Asterisk, Auguries, by Lawrence Binion, Lane, One Dollar Net, one of the most satisfying collections of verse of a noteworthy poet who is too little known and appreciated in this country. Its grave classical beauty will never assure it popularity, but at its best it is worthy to stand beside Mr. Bridges, and it contains no poem that is not excellent. Fairy Hinsky is a lyric which no future anthologist can overlook. Next to Mr. Orenberg's poems, the most satisfying new volume artistically of the year, it demands silence and complete surrender. Broadsheet Ballads, with an introduction by Padraic Colum, Norman Remington, 75 cents net, a narrow but good selection of the best of the broadsheet ballads, which occupy so definite a place in Irish poetry. These waifs and strays have been gathered previously in various collections, but never before in a volume calculated to appeal to the general public. An introduction telling the story of this form of art and the characteristics of its audiences and appeal to them is prefixed. Asterisk, Syrinx, Pastels of Hellas, by Mitchell S. Buck, Claire Marie, $1.25 net, a volume of prose poems of reticent pagan art, suggestive of the best work of Pierre Louise, unique in American poetry and really beautiful. In the High Hills by Maxwell Struthers Burt, Houghton Mifflin, $1.25 net, the verse in this volume is of a kind that has eminent qualities without eminent distinction. The earnestness and sincerity of Mr. Burt's poetic moods give to his poetry those sound qualities which at least compel attention if they do not excite the emotions. The elements of poetry are not fused with imaginative heat in his work, and hence it lacks magic, but it reflects the gentlemanly feeling of a lover of poetry and verse which demands respect. The Sun Thief and other poems by Rise Carpenter, Oxford University Press, $1.75 net. Competent academic verse on classical models, including a new version of the Prometheus legend. The Poet and Nature, What He Saw and What He Heard by Madison Kawine. John P. Morton and Company, Louisville, Kentucky, $1.50. A volume of prose and verse designed to encourage a love of poetry in children. The first half of the volume is in the form of a juvenile story with previously published lyrics of Mr. Cowine interspersed as examples of poetic beauty. The second half of the volume consists of hitherto uncollected poems of nature by Mr. Cowine, now gathered together under the title of The Morning Road. This part of the volume should give a special pleasure to Mr. Coyne's readers. Green Days and Blue Days by Patrick R. Chalmers, Norman Remington, $1 net. A pleasant volume of light verse by a contributor to Punch. 
The verses do not pretend to be more than agreeable diversions and reflect the lighter moods of life happily and in delicate numbers. At the Shrine and Other Poems by George Herbert Clark, Stewart and Kidd, $1.25 net. A pleasant, unassuming collection of somewhat academic verse reflecting a life of scholarly leisure. The closing sections of letters in verse to departed novelists is particularly happy, recalling at no great distance the similar work of Austin Dobson. Asterisk, Path Flower by Olive Tilford Dargan, Scribner, $1.25 net. With this volume of lyrical poems, Olive Tilford Dargan definitely takes her place as one of our foremost younger poets, with much of Francis Thompson's vision of an overarching heaven and a shadowed earth, and also much of Thompson's mannerism. She is herself in the best of these poems, in which she treats high themes with high artistic fervor. Her feeling for landscape is English in its delicacy, and she has interpreted the influence of nature on human life and its incidents with clear insight and sympathy. No one will deny Mrs. Dargan's poetic inspiration or the refinement of her vision. Florence on a Certain Night and Other Poems by Coningsby Dawson Holt, $1.25 net a volume of undistinguished literary verse by a distinguished novelist. Asterisk, America and Other Poems by W. J. Dawson, Lane, $1.25 net. The expression of an ideal America as seen by one with an alien tradition. The volume includes several fine ballad narratives, notably The Kiss, Salome, and the Swiftshire Rhythmic, Last Ride of the Sheik Abdullah. Above all, Blake's Homecoming, a member of the royal line of English ballads. In addition to competent lyrics on various themes, special attention should be called to the poems of childhood and the delicately imagined meditative poems of religious feeling. So many religious poems rely wholly on a good intention, more fit to pave hell than cause rejoicing in heaven, as a French critic says, that exceptions should be noted. The volume marks an appreciable advance over Dr. Dawson's previous collections. A pageant of the 13th century for the 700th anniversary of Roger Bacon, the text by John Erskine, Columbia University Press a pageant reflecting the culture and endeavor of the 13th century in every field. The text is in verse a fine texture and imaginative expression by Professor Erskine of Columbia University. While the pageant itself has been deferred because of the war, it is still possible to enjoy the text and to look forward to the pageant's representation in the near future. Lux Juventudis a Book of Verse by Catherine A. Esdale, Houghton Mifflin, $1.25 net. The first volume of a young English poet who shows considerable promise. It is characterized by classical restraint and a fine feeling for form and does not lack singing quality. Asterisk, Sonnets from the Patagonian by Donald Evans. Claire Marie, $1.25 net. 18 impressionistic sonnets of exotic workmanship suggesting the fantasy of La Forgue, but more extremely composed in disembodied words. They rely on tone color for much of their effect and are bizarre to the point of irony. However, they grow on the reader as he becomes familiar with them, and their consummate art is unquestionable. Asterisk, Sonnets of a Portrait Painter by Arthur Davison Fick, Kinnerly, $1 net, a sequence of 57 sonnets in an undeservedly neglected form, which do not recall too definitely Meredith's modern love.
They are extremely subtle and their intellectual content is very closely woven so that they will prove difficult reading, but they repay careful study. And in many sonnets, the lyric impulse has happily overmastered the poet completely, a collection which is worthy of several readings. Asterisk, Arrows in the Gale by Arturo Giovanniti. Hillacre Bookhouse, Riverside, Connecticut, $1.25 net. One of the more important volumes of New Verse this year, a passionate voicing of social injustice in imaginative strophes, which introduce a new poetic form with considerable art. The Cage, when printed in the Atlantic Monthly last year, was called the most significant poem published in that periodical since Moody's Ode in Time of Hesitation. The volume claims a hearing as fine poetry rather than as an expression of syndicalism. There is an appreciative introduction by Helen Keller, which is good criticism. Asterisk, My Lady's Book by Gerald Gold. Kennerly, One Dollar Net. 20 lyrics of pure song quality, which are almost faultless in their perfection, though in a minor key. A volume to afford pure delight by its unaffected lyric quality. Poems by Catherine Howard, Sherman French, One Dollar Net, Minor Verse and Vers Libre, which is frequently pleasing and always individual. It is the expression of a whimsical personality who wears her singing robes lightly and who is most successful in verse of macabre suggestion. Asterisk, Day's Imagist, an anthology, Boney, One Dollar, the best collection of Imagist poetry in which the work of Ford Maddox Huffer, F.S. Flint, Amy Lowell, and others is represented. There are many poems in the volume which will give pleasure, but as a collection, it is uneven and rather tenuous. The work of F.S. Flint, which it contains, justifies the volume's purchase. The Thresher's Wife by Harry Kemp, Boney, 40 cents net, a narrative poem well told in the manner of Maysfield, whose influence upon it has been great. Asterisk. Trees and Other Poems by Joyce Kilmer, Doran, One Dollar Net, The Spirit of Youth and Grave Faith Expressed in Lyric Numbers. This slight little book defines a personality of poetic interest. The book shows less alien influence than most recent American poetry and is quite individual in its affirmations. Though unassuming, the book will not meet with just treatment unless we recognize the fine lyric accomplishment of such poems as Trees and Martin. Is this volume the prelude of a little Catholic renaissance in American poetry? Asterisk, The Shadow of Etna by Louis V. Lido, Putnam, One Dollar Net. Severely chaste poetry on classical models of distinguished beauty. They reveal fine intellectual feeling that recalls Shelley in its intensity and Arnold in its disciplined reticence. They have all the warmth of life seen against an eternal background and a passionate message which cannot go unheeded. Asterisk, The Sharing by Agnes Lee, Sherman French, One Dollar Net. Agnes Lee's new book has all her familiar qualities but in addition it presents a new criticism of life which reveals a feeling for human values akin in many respects to that of Browning. In its brevity and search for the polished word, it suggests the sculptor's art, and many of these poems would have pleased Landor for their freight of suggestion and elemental simplicity. Asterisk, Sword Blades and Poppy Seed by Amy Lowell Macmillan, $1.25 net, a volume not only of interesting experiment in Versley and exotic rhythms, but of notable accomplishment in poetry. Though associated with the Imagist School of English Poetry, Miss Lowell's talent is independent of it, and in her narrative and lyric poems alike, one feels an artistic firmness and restraint which results in clear vision clearly sung.
Best of all, this imagist poetry is healthy and able to fight for its existence insofar as it is derivative from French influences. It adds a new note to English verse and reveals a subtle use of free cadenced rhythms, which is fully responsive to the mood and feeling of the poem, far more genuine and spontaneous than Miss Lowell's first volume. The Passing Singer and Other Poems by Samuel Henry Marcus, Stratford Publishing Company, $1 net, a modest first volume which is likely to receive less attention than it deserves. Mr. Marcus has not yet found himself in poetry, but he sings the present condition of humanity sincerely and passionately. When he sings it simply, he will be more satisfying but this volume will give pleasure to anyone who really cares for poetry. Asterisk, Poems by Edward Sandford Martin, Scribner, $1.50 net, the collected verse of the editor of life, mellow Horatian philosophy and wit, not yet frostbitten by a man whom Dr. Johnson would have pronounced clubbable and with whom Boswell's must feel uncomfortable. You and I by Harriet Monroe, Macmillan, $1.25 net, a bulky volume of verse by the editor of Poetry, a magazine of verse. In it, the social note is voiced strongly, and expression is given to many phases of modern effort, but its intellectual content rather overshadows its lyric quality. Asterisk, The Sea is Kind by T. Sturge Moore, Houghton Mifflin, $1.50 net. This is the first collection issued in America of the poems of an English craftsman of great distinction and power, whose chief weakness is an over-proportion of intellectual substance. He lacks the glow of beauty and perhaps of beauty's realization, but his work is literary craftsmanship of the highest order, and his metrical experiments are almost as significant as those of Mr. Bridges, altogether the artistic product of a richly stored mind without aspiration or imaginative vision. Asterisk, Saloon Sonnets with Sunday Flutings by Alan Norton, Claire Marie, $1.25 net, a volume less bizarre than its title implies. The sonnets bear evidence of uber-culture, but occasionally surprise the reader by their pleasant lyric charm. They do not lack virility and enthusiasm. The Sister of the Wind by Grace Fellow Norton, Houghton Mifflin, $1 net. A new volume by the author of Little Grey Songs from St. Joseph's, which is most disappointing. In a poet of Miss Norton's quality, it is inevitable that there should be always something to repay the reader, but this volume is singularly unrepresentative of Miss Norton's real powers. Celtic Memories by Norris Jefferson O'Connor, Lane, one dollar net, a first volume of some promise by a recent graduate of Harvard, whose Irish feeling is drawn directly from experience but whose expression is still drawn chiefly from books. Asterisk, The Even Muse and Other Poems by Leon Lavio, Englished by John Myers O'Hara, Smith and Sale, $2 net. Translation from the work of a young Creole poet glorifying the fil de couleur in love poetry of original beauty, differing from Latin and Oriental passion alike. It reveals a type of feminine beauty which is wholly new to northern readers. Asterisk, an epilogue to the praise of Angus and other poems by Shamus O'Sullivan. Norman Remington Company, 75 cents net. A thin sheaf of delicate poems by one of the foremost poets of the new Ireland. Akin in certain aspects of his vision to E, who does not surpass him. His verses have more singing quality, and he is a successful experimenter in various new verse forms which reproduce cadences in ancient Irish music. Asterisk, One Woman to Another and Other Poems by Corinne Roosevelt Robinson. 
Scribner, $1.25 net. Dramatic monologues and sonnets of sharply etched lines whose competence is questionable, and a more satisfying reality of human feeling than in Mrs. Robinson's previous volume. The volume will give much intellectual and some emotional pleasure, and in two or three lyrics the poet has achieved high ground. Asterisk, Beyond the Breakers and Other Poems by George Sterling Robertson $1.25 net. This is Mr. Sterling's first thoroughly satisfying book. It includes the superb Ode on the Centenary of the Birth of Robert Browning and poems of such importance as Title, King of Nations, Willie Pitcher, The Mission Swallows, Past the Pains, and You Never Can Tell. We must call particular attention to the vision of the noble ode entitled Beyond the Sunset with less opulent diction and heady imagination than Mr. Sterling's earlier volumes, Beyond the Breakers shows a disciplined vision expressed with a disciplined technique. Open Water by Arthur Stringer, Lane, One Dollar Net, a collection of delicate pictures expressing many frail and drifting moods phrased in ver libre, not yet quite sure of itself, the volume contains much quiet beauty and is prefaced by a plea for ver libre of considerable documentary and critical value, a volume which the lover of poetry can scarcely neglect. Idols of Greece, third series, by Howard V. Sutherland, Fitzgerald, one dollar net. Modest idols of Greek fable telling with some passages of beauty the tales of Idas and Marpessa, Rodanthe, Sappho and Phaon, and Enon. The blank verse, though not firm, is of well-wrought texture, and Mr. Sutherland expresses feelingly the fleeting beauty of pagan love and Hellenic landscape. Mr. Sutherland's three volumes merit more attention than they have received. The Poems of Francois Villon, translated by H. Devere Stackpole, Lane, $1.50 net, a convenient edition of Villon's best work in which a reasonably accurate text of the two testaments and the best of the ballads and rondelles is printed, together with a running commentary, a vivid introduction, and translations of some of the shorter poems with dubious success. However, the volume is the best popular service to Villon that has yet been performed in this country and should be on the library shelf. Asterisk, Little Verse for a Little Clan by F.D.W. Published privately, not for sale. A slight little volume of 35 pages of delicate workmanship which contain poems that make the book rank among the very best of the year. I know of very few books written by Americans which would afford the pleasure to discriminating readers that this volume would offer were it to be published in a form accessible to all. It is as delicate, at its best, as Beeching and McHale's Love in Idleness, and will please all lovers of A Shropshire Lad. It is just the sort of book which Mr. Mosher used to delight in finding for the American public. I shall be glad to give further information about it to inquirers. Eris, a dramatic allegory by Blanche Shoemaker Wagstaff. Moffat Yard and Company, $1 net. A short dramatic allegory in which the elements of poetry are present, but which is hardly successful in fusing them into life. There are several pages of genuine poetry which prove the certainty of the poet's ultimate accomplishment and much competent craftsmanship. This is an honest book whose weakness is that the imagination of the reader has no suggestive substance to feed upon. Justification, a Philosophic Fantasy by John H. White, Richard G. Badger, $1.00. A poem in four short cantos, and though philosophic in conception, is full of abstract idealisms. The author has a fruitful imagination, but his reasoning on the origin and destiny of human life is profound. The verse, though concrete, is flexible. 
Asterisk, The Collected Poems of Margaret L. Woods, Lane, $1.50 net. The definitive edition of the poetry and drama of a great weaver of words and emotion who unites too much of Lionel Johnston's repressed somberness, a sustained beauty of musical effect, which was characteristic of the earlier poet. Mrs. Woods has performed for Oxford the poetic service that Johnson performed for Winchester, and in other poems has added new immortalities to Westminster Abbey's crown. The plays are finely wrought and deeply felt, and together with the lyrics, place Mrs. Woods in the authentic English poetic line. End of section 80. End of Anthology of Magazine Verse for 1914, edited by William Stanley Braithwaite.